quit screaming. Happy Monday, everybody. Apologies for the swear words. Did not know that they were in this song. Oh, I <laughs> didn't even hear them. That's oh, how that's go. how that's how adult inured these these ears are. Uh that's kind of wild. Um yeah. So uh, you just phased it out? Yeah, I guess. Huh. Huh. Hello everybody. We are gonna do the Weird Things podcast here in just a moment. Got a special fun, fun new feature here on the stream. Uh if you're watching on desktop, we now have there's a an app that we're using that will do a closed caption so if you uh are interested if you like to watch with subtitles uh this is a soft a software caption on top of the screen i uh, just click that cc button yeah I'm sure that'll be entertaining <laughs> it, it's I, I found about it because i saw someone else using it on twitch the other night but it's actually pretty pretty good we have a chrome window over here on the encoding pc that is just, uh, it's just taking the mic and translating it over there. And is it, uh, I feel like I want to run over there and look at it. Can I look at it real quick? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. And um, yeah, I can keep talking a little bit, but so it shows that it's, not, it's obviously transcribed, it's like auto transcribed. So it's not like speaker voices and perfect punctuation, but it seems pretty cool. And uh, 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 it seems, let's see. How uh, accurate is it, Brian? I grabbed the fish by its tail, swung it over my head, hit the wall, hit the here. cat, and everybody was swell. Yeah. It's pretty good, and it will go back and, like, correct itself. So, yeah. like, I saw it earlier it said purple, and then it changed it to proper. Yeah, you could see it correcting itself midstream. I, I would say it's uh, every bit as good as, uh, you know, when you're, when you're hanging out at a restaurant and they've got the closed captioning on. You know, and very clearly we've moved beyond humans doing all of that stuff, and, and it's kind of surprising to, to watch it pop out the words and then go back and fix it stuff mm -hmm. I, I i i'd say it's it's very accurate yeah cool uh so everybody check that out if uh if people are interested apparently there's a a thing where people can uh, they they people can pay bits to have the tr that transcription uh translated like all uh, machine translated so that's a neat thing uh but i figured we got the podcast pretty helpful and i think it'll let us take transcripts too so we might be able to do something with that years ago we you know did what you could do hold on service. i just had an idea what if we took that transcript and we ran it in to andrew's podcast creation engine so <laughs> <laughs> and then we had the transcript come out from that and then we ran it through the podcast and, creation and engine. just randomly have it assigned speakers yeah <laughs> I actually have an API that, that can do that, that I built, that plugs into Google's uh, transcription. Um, uh, we Years ago, you know, we used one of the slash human slash machine services to create a transcript for every episode of Weird Things. Oh, really? Nobody read them. <laughs> so I'm like, mm -hmm. hey, it's in podcasts. <laughs> like, I'm sure it may be useful to some people, though. That's a thing to think about is, is for people who might be, you know, hearing impaired etc so it is is something to be mindful of now to say oh you know what maybe there is a reason to do that but yeah yeah i feel like there was um there was an an interview that i read that was like it was an episode of someone's podcast and it was an interview but they had the transcription on the website and that's how i could find the interview mm -hmm. uh, because it helps because all of that becomes search content and then i could yeah, just read it instead of having to download a podcast yeah, Google and Apple are actually doing that with every podcast now, like behind the scenes to make them searchable. Is is they're creating their own sort of indexes of this to do it, um, and it's pretty it's pretty straightforward. Like I I was using a service called Camera Tag for like video stuff. On the back end, they will upload it to whatever like folder you want, like Google or whatever, Google. So I uploaded it to Google Cloud, and I create what's called a cloud function. As soon as anything got uploaded there, I would do 
all of that stuff. It's funny how pervasive. It's nice. It's cool how pervasive it is. I guess so. Yeah. All righty. Uh, recordings are going. Streams looking good. Everybody want to? Uh, you guys want to start a show? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well then, Andrew, why don't you bring us in in three, two. To what? <laughs> negative <laughs> one. <laughs> negative two. <laughs> negative <laughs> three. <laughs> negative five. <laughs> Just take it from the top, Here people. We Here we go. In three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Adrian Mead, joined by Mr. Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. Gentlemen, um, good to be back. Good to Welcome be back. back, Andrew. I, I don't know why you would say that. Uh, I mean, I understand you got busy with your political podcast, but I mean, you've always been here. <laughs> True that. I was in the, I was in, uh, he was in Iowa messing with some or machines. Wherever politics are decided and it's all decided now. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't know if you were around when we were, when I was pitching this, but I was begging Justin. He had a, a quick gig in Idaho before he went to Iowa, and I wanted him to run around with the camera and say, "Hi, I'm a journalist. I have a politics podcast. Can I just ask you some questions about uh, about politics?" And then, uh, increasingly through the questions, make it clear that he's confused and he thinks that <laughs> he's, he's in, in Iowa, Iowa. Not Idaho, <laughs> <laughs> and then let people figure it out. That's that would be an amazing viral video. <laughs> There is this amazing human capacity, though, of how we'll start talking with somebody and maybe not get context. And we try to, we we're just talking about this before the show about how we're using transcription now that we'll go back and correct it. Because then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I get what you mean now. And so sometimes we'll go a long ways talking to somebody, trying to get the context of it. And then you're like, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. And then you go, then you might go, oh, I have no idea what we're talking about. Or here. there's that moment that you realize, oh, wait, they think I'm somebody else. They think I'm this other yeah. person. Yep, yep, yep. They think I'm somebody who knows things. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, the name of the show isn't Knows Things. <laughs> yeah, we don't. So, um, you know, did have we talked about Wuhan? Have we talked about the? Oh my God! Uh, For a split second, novel? I thought you were about to say, "Have we talked about Elon Musk?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 I don't uh, know if you noticed my shirt, by the way. Uh, yeah. what, uh, what is that? It looks like an. Oh, that's the that's the shatter from the Cybertruck. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> oh, that's great! I thought it was like the, that. Should be the. I look like a comet to his, to his trance album. <laughs> Uh, uh, official Tesla merchandise. Like, oh, that's official... great! <laughs> yes. Oh, that's great! <laughs> <laughs> I, I, we knew when that happened. It was you. If we're back in, uh, just for those of you who know, back when they unveiled the Cybertruck, the not at all controversial vehicle from Tesla, <laughs> Elon Musk went to display the 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 shatterproof window. <laughs> and prior to displaying the shatterproof window, they took a sledgehammer to the side of this Tesla truck, which was which was impressive. And then they took a big metal ball and hit the window, and it shattered and and realized a property of glass that once you get a micro fracture doesn't matter how strong it is it's gonna crack <laughs> and so it cracked right on there and you could see a visibly frustrated elon musk <laughs> um and uh but it's a musk you're like you know what he's gonna laugh about this tomorrow and then sure enough here in the tesla merchandise store we now have the cyber truck shattered window <laughs> Uh, oh, oh, so speaking of which, I, I, and, and, and here's a rare moment when it's Brian that insists we go into Elon things. Uh, d uh, being here in Texas, I don't know if you heard the the rumblings. You know, he, uh, Elon Musk changed his uh, location to Austin, Texas. There was talk about a, a, a gigafactory, you know, to generate batteries here in Texas. Um, and the analysis was basically that would fix, first of all, uh, pickup trucks, tend to be a very specific demographically targeted market and uh they labeled it the cowboy problem is if you are somebody who actually has a ranch and actually is doing all this stuff then you want the reliability of your ford f-150 people who are into pickup trucks get really geeked out about you know who has the more, most torque the fastest you know acceleration efficiency blah 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 but if uh, so, so as uh, with a reputation of being a Silicon Valley startup, that's problematic for Tesla to try to break into that market, especially with 
what some might consider a fairly over the top ridiculous cyberpunk design of of a, of a truck but if it's born and bred in texas manufactured locally by american workers then that that might quote unquote solve the cowboy problem was the uh, was what the news article said i you know i i don't know i i i you know my you know, my thinking on it is, you know, they're in Nevada is where they have a big facility right now. The Gigafactory 2 is is at um, certainly in the Texas environment. The idea that it's made in state could probably help. I think I think the F-150 is like it to transport for like kind of an industrial or kind of transportation. It's almost like the container, like the, the international. It is such a staple such an important thing not just because of the brand name but because of the reliability the parts the idea of just there's so much more to it than you know i think a lot of people from the outside who didn't grow up around trucks or whatever may even appreciate you know sure well so, and, and uh, whether you're whether you're hauling farm equipment or industrial equipment or whatever there comes this moment when sure i wouldn't mind flying a ufo uh but i I know that at the end of the day, I have to know that replacement parts are always mm -hmm. available. I have to know that it has a certain level of reliability. I know that my insurance company has to be not confused about how to set uh, rates for, for X, Y, and Z. I have to be able to fuel it. Right. Oh, exactly. Yep. Right. And and uh, 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 although, am I right? The Cybertruck could go up to like 500 miles. Is that what they're talking about? Yeah, it's going to be something insane. I and I I think that's going to be a slow adoption, but all those points you made are are those are you know, it's yeah, super super critical. And I think that's one of the things we think about in any system like, oh, why don't we do X? Why don't we do X? And it's like, you know, there's the uh what was the expression from uh, alchemy talked about when you come across like a a fence across a road before you pull away the fence, ask why it's there. And you have to understand why something works so well, why we're so dependent upon it. And it's like when we have this like I'm, I'm wearing a Tesla shirt, but when I hear people like, "Oh, let's get rid of fossil fuels," I'm like, I don't think you know what that means. <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't think, I don't think you know. Like I'm, I'm all for the eventual sort of thing, but like, well, let's and, ban and, gas and next week. It's, <laughs> it's really a matter of of risk tolerance, and I think there's, uh, if you're running a business, if you're running a family, once you have something to lose, uh, a lot of people discover they have less appetite for risk than than one might think no matter how cool the flashy other thing is you know like uh the delorean looks very very cool also looks an awful lot like a cyber truck but it's lack of availability of parts the fact that the guy didn't really know how to design an automobile from the ground up or whatever there's a reason that it was a that it was a failure and so i i, yeah. I, I don't blame anybody who has something to lose for for playing it safe when it comes to picking what tr truck they're going for yeah, it was like related was like in again, I'm very pro shifting to electric solar limit. They were very, very clear. But there was a story that came out like a week or so ago about I guess at Oxford some students had pushed for administration to like to to divest from investing in oil and all that. Like, ah, we shouldn't be in oil stocks, blah, 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 blah. And we should get away from oil entirely. <laughs> and, the, and the administrator was like, hey, great. Why don't we shut off heating? How about that? Because we have to use oil to heat the place. Are you okay if we just shut that off now? And they're like, oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Wait, let's let's not do that. Um, so back, it's more nuanced than that. But yeah. Back to to, to Wuhan. Are, 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 we, are we about to talk about uh, uh, a Michael Crichton novel in the making? Uh, yeah. So let's put a caveat first here. We don't know what the heck we're talking about and dot, dot, dot. Neither do a lot of people on the internet or even a lot of bloggers and stuff know what they're talking about because we don't know a lot about it. We're trying to figure this thing out as it goes along. Mm -hmm. And this isn't meant to be like, ah, run for the hills, everybody. Nor is it supposed to be like, ah, it's nothing. You know, it's 50 million people in quarantine. They're having fun. And, you know, it's, it's, we don't know. And I guess, yeah, it is uh, exactly what you just said, Brian. You know, you watch the little map and you watch the thing spread and, and you look at like, you know, I was sitting at Denny's talking to my girlfriend behind her. The TV shows like, you know, the military quarantining someplace somewhere and people in masks and stuff. I'm like, this is how this is how a horror movie starts is we're just going about our business and the things going on in the background. Mm -hmm. you know? We we definitely and and uh, fingers crossed it won't history will not judge me un, uh, uh, poorly for 
for my my flippant hot take. Uh, but but as coronavirus first started to make the news, I found it rather curious that there were two simultaneous statements from the Chinese uh, government. One that only two thousand people were infected. The second being we're going to build a hospital that can handle tens <laughs> of thousands of people in ten days. You know, and I was yeah. like. Those two don't seem to match, and so <laughs> yeah, and 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 we will just so every we we the the technical name and 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 the only reason I'm clarifying this now because there is going to be we we'll it's we'll say coronavirus, but it's 2019 in COV, you know, because coronavirus includes like SARS and MERS and other stuff. There's a, a, a coronavirus lot is any virus that that is on the uh, the corona the fringes. It, it's it's a derivation. It's a new mutation. Yeah, it's so a dance it, it, sensation. It be, Let's do the yeah. time warp again. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I so I'll give you an example of like my 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 shaking my head was I read an article and I don't want to say it's from it was basically like from a fash or you know like a beauty blogger person on a previously pretty famous website that now you know blah blah blah. But anyhow. And they're like, hey, worry about the flu, not this. And I'm like, well, maybe worry about both when I saw the headline. Like, I, I'm like, flu, we know. This, we do not know. And so to say, don't worry about a thing that all of our information, as Brian just pointed out, is being controlled by a government notorious for controlling things, even to the point of people dying. I have a friend who swears their grandfather died from SARS before it had been announced, but China had kept you know, a lid on that. So mm -hmm. maybe, but anyhow... And they go into like one in that article that's supposed to be informist. They talk to a doctor who is not directly involved in this, um, but you know they get some. You know, and he's like, ah, oh, people need to worry about flu, which is yes, true, worry about flu. But they never use the correct name for it. They never mention, you know, the 2019 NCOV, right? So they never mention that name, which is one. If you just do a search, you're only going to find coronavirus. They use the Wuhan coronavirus, which is not a official name. Then they go in there and they say, "Hey, uh, right now, at, you know, right now they say, you know, so far only um, like 28,000 people are infected and 520 people have died." Okay, and then they link to the Johns Hopkins map. Three hours after they'd posted the article, if you go to the Johns Hopkins mass, uh, map, the number of infected had number of infected and dump, jumped by like four or five thousand people, and the number of dead had jumped by like 80 people which was just had to do with the update at which this map had been done and when they wrote the article. But, but if you go by the article, like, don't panic. Well, then you click there to read through the, there. You'd be like, oh, my God. In the last three hours, there's been like a 30% increase in infections and death rate. You'd be like, no, I guess we do panic now. And it's just that example of uh, very bad. Yeah, since this article was published you know, a week ago, like the number of deads almost doubled. You know, And Grant, I don't know what to make of that, but I know that somebody writing an article saying don't panic who then <laughs> uses very panicking information unintentionally, not ideal. Can, um, there was an article by Ron Bailey, and I, th I think it was published on Reason.com, or maybe it was elsewhere, and then they reprinted it on um, Reason.com. But he, uh, and again, uh, man, oh man, do human beings love the narrative of an out-of-control virus that kills everybody. Yeah. Uh, we love being scared about it. We love watching the numbers climb. Um, it There is an inherent bias in news coverage for if I was an editor in chief, then uh, it seems like there's more dollars in spreading fear than not. Uh, but Ron Bailey sort of uh, made the case, um, and again, bold take that look, uh, information spreads faster than viruses can physically make it, and our ability to contain things and to change policies and to quarantine uh, happens faster than the the virus is capable of spreading. And uh, he, he suggests, I think fairly lightly, I don't think he makes a hard case for it, but he suggests that maybe humanity has seen its last pandemic, uh, assuming that we don't have some kind of massive backslide in cooperation between humans who want to stop uh, pandemics. And so yeah. he suggests so that, 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 yes, this will be another exciting event to watch, but uh, but uh e even though it does appear to be more deadly than SARS it does appear to be spreading faster than SARS or whatever uh his general case seemed to be uh if i was a betting person and i am then i'd bet on humanity that so we there won't be another 
the virus pandemics. or uh, another uh, not not on the level of your Spanish flus from the 19 uh, or early 20th centuries or or any of any of those numbers like just seeing uh, it, it's basically it seems like he was making a testament to uh, when you compare side by side what a hundred years ago the spread of a p- pandemic looked like versus the massive action and the speed with which uh, impactful actions are taken, that it seems fairly unlikely that anything will spread as big or as fast as we saw a hundred years ago. Well, I have the article in front of me, and and I'm and disclosure, I'm friends with Ron, and I want to get Ron's latest take on this because he doesn't mention bur- he doesn't mention Spanish flu, he mentions avian flu as the example in 2003. Right. Correct. And the, and, and and the and I think that the theory is right. The problem is is when it's a state actor like China, which has a, a vested interest in not letting information spread. We've already passed avian flu death rate. We've already passed that. And so this is a pandemic. That's the thing. Is like this is technically a pandemic in the rate of spread. And I think the problem is is that uh, because there was a lockdown, like the doctor who one of the first people to discover this and explain, hey, tell his friends, hey, something's going on was punished. The other people were punished. That guy has since passed away from Wuhan, which is scary when, you know, one of the first medical personnel to explain this. So I think that had the Chinese government learned the lesson and behaved in a, you know, more open way, probably Ron would be right. Well, but and I, I think the- I believe and man, I wish I wish I had known we were going to talk about this because I would have reviewed the article, but I think he mentioned the astonishing speed at which we had fully sequenced the uh, uh, the, the genome of, of it. Uh, anyway, the viruses, do they have DNA? Yeah, no, well, yeah. they inject DNA. What's that? Uh, do viruses have DNA or do they inject oh, DNA? Generally they- RNA. They're RNA, but then at which you can sequence the RNA. But yeah, and that's all true. That is he's 100% right on the state of the tech. But remember when he wrote this, as it says there, if you go down, 41 people had been infected. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. And, 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 was, and again, like I'm not uh, I'm, I'm not going to say everybody, please uh, spit on your hands and shake hands and then lick your hands. I mean, like, I think I, what if I, we were I, already I, doing that? <laughs> Can I keep and, doing and it? I think I think it would be far worse without those. I think you're I mean, the the, the I think the, the technical points are right. I think without those measures, it could have been far worse. It could have spread far faster. I think the tech, I, the technology has evolved considerably in the last two decades since we we dealt with the avian flu and SARS and MERS. Even you know, and the problem is is that I think the I think what's going to happen after the fact is we're going to be what should we have known before? And I mentioned like with the case of SARS is what China held back on information on that and it had spread to other countries when China knew what was going on. And here, you know, the frustrating thing is is that. Uh, you know, the way China sort of works, not that noted Chinese expert Andrew Main, um, every region has, like, you have regional governors and then you have smaller regions. Everybody sort of, the information suppression starts at sort of the lowest level. It starts at your 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 company or it starts at your organization, and they try to c- suppress whatever they think won't displease the people above them. And likewise, all the way up to the top of the party and then to the hate leader of the party. Sure. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, as I imagine a little footnote, and then at the bottom of the page, it says, see HBO's Chernobyl, you know, for, for more details. Yeah. <laughs> it's slightly more efficient, but basically, yeah, you know, um, and that's that's the thing is, is you get, you know, you get all the way up. I don't want the people above me to get upset or else I'm going to be pulled from my position or my job. I don't want the people above me. And, you know, some doctors say, oh, no, we think there's something thing. Nobody wants that. And and generally speaking, they're wrong. They're, well, it isn't the thing they think it is. It's, you know, oh, it's, or they're afraid it is because the chances of that happening. And so you get all that layer of suppression all the way up. And meanwhile, people are spreading. That was one of the things, the scary things about Wuhan was the number of people that left the area mm-hmm. before the and quarantine we, came. We, we talked either last week or the week before about a company that was using AI or machine learning to try to track uh, possible Wuhan coronavirus cases uh, and get the government and the global health community n- to to recognize uh, sort of the early warning signs of this. But even even still, it there it's it seems like a pretty devastating disease. And I think about like, I mean, it, <laughs> the I mean the, the the we we talked about the flu earlier, but like 
every year we are trying to figure out we're just guessing what the flu is going to be every year and right. sometimes it sometimes we're close and sometimes we're not and so if and the, if that's something we're dealing with every year like i i think we will continue to find very difficult to 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 handle viruses so i had a a random and yet it turns out connected thought uh, right before we went live uh, with the show, we were talking about the fact that we're using an AI bot to auto transcribe everything that we're saying right now so that we can have closed captioning and all that. And I remember wondering right now, if you want to set the subject of what we're talking about in Twitch, you have to make the decision of like, oh, we're talking about trans rights. We're talking about Fortnite. We're talking about the Lego movie or whatever. Oh. Um, uh, it seems like once everything we're saying is being auto-translated, then an AI could very quickly figure out, much like, depending on what vehicle you're behind, based on three bumper stickers, you could have a pretty good assumption of where somebody is on the political spectrum. From certain uses of language, I would assume that an AI would be able to figure out where, likewise, not only what we're talking about, but imagine if just by monitoring all of social media, and in fact, as I'm saying this, I'm assuming it has to already exist in some form, that you could look for keywords that are synonyms or indicative of certain symptoms, and you can intuit basically by listening to everybody all at the same time, you can real time sense the, uh, the, the spread of a disease based on what people are saying. Uh, at, at, or, uh, at any given time. Do you, do you think we'll, we'll start to see even faster than the reactions that Ron Bailey's talking about? Do you think we'll get to a place where an a AI, like before even a single human recognizes that there's a new uh, coronavirus of whatever virus spreading, the AI could say like, been listening to you guys. There's clearly something new. It's clearly in this area. Yeah, you better hustle up and, and, and investigate these people. I I'm I'm sure that we're going to see uh, starting like in, in places where personal data freedom or prior or privacy just don't exist in China and stuff like how uh, you're going to probably want to see one will be first is it's a, a thing like that but using like hospital records you know thing like that using you know uh, basically trying to measure. At, at that level, like take the humans out of the equation and say like, hey, you know, we had a holiday season this weekend and we had twice as many show up in the emergency room on a Monday than we did before. And there are staying, things like that right now that like all the kind of health agencies sort of monitor to a, to a degree, but I don't know. I don't think it's anywhere as sophisticated as we think it could be. And then, you know, to the social media stuff like that, things like that, like yeah, there's a ton of information out there. Like, you know, who's sick, tracking, who's not moving, who didn't leave their house today because they're feeling ill and stuff. And you know, the, the, the danger of anything, of course, is like, you know, you know, separating when, you know, everybody goes and watches the movie Contagion. Then the next day we all feel like, oh, I'm going to I don't know if I feel well. Do you feel well? I don't know. I don't feel well. And it's like, oh, there's a virus. But yeah. And, right, and that, that like the what you're describing, the, the the issue, I think, for today would be horsepower. Just I mean, that's not big data. That's all data, all data being looked at uh, in broad uh, by a computer for one purpose. Oh, I don't, I, just, uh, we got an offer from uh, some Chinese investors, Brian, to buy your company. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I don't even think you need all data. I think just a, a, I mean, you're a talking statistically about... significant sample size. You know, you take 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 a hundred thousand accounts and uh, analyze their posting track record. Um, when do they stop posting? When a week later do they come back and talk about how they were sick or whatever? Then all of a sudden, like the mere fact that somebody's not posting becomes a data vector, and then you you, you locate that to what like what area they're in and 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 that who, kind of stuff. Who but else this would be detecting them, exactly, you know? exactly, and who uh -huh. who you know they met based on the 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 geotags from the photos that they're doing or whatever. Like it doesn't have to be all data. We don't have to make up a fantasy scenario. I think as long as it's statistically significant significant you're able to, to get a jump on it yeah if you build a profile of like what does a person do when they get sick like you know of, of what that how does that map up to that and I'm, I'm sure we're gonna see that you know the other thing too is like the more we develop you know on chip detectors the more we develop the ability to to sequence this stuff and figure this thing out in real time it'd be great because like like i was i spent some time on twitter saying hey like i was 
going like, hey, like, listen, there's a lot of like mis misleading information out there, you know, that, that some of it's good intention, but some of it's like, oh, don't panic, but not well and well intentioned, but not well informed. And some of it's like, ah, it's a plan, it's a conspiracy. And it's, I'm just like, hey, listen, like, follow the CDC emergency Twitter tag, follow the ad who Twitter tag, use common sense and wash your damn hands, you know? And that's my thing was like, I did a thing, like I said, like, I think it's socially acceptable now. If you see somebody who doesn't wash their hands in a bathroom, to follow them out with a bell and keep ringing it and shame, shame, shame them. <laughs> um, most everybody said yeah, and then I had one, I had one person who said, "Oh, I, I, I don't wash my hands," and I'm like, "Well, you're a sociopath, you know? Like, what's <laughs> the story on this?" And she said, "Well, I have like OCD about washing my hands, and to the point that like I was having." I'm like, "Okay, well, that's that's a different thing where you've got some psychological thing that you're dealing with, which I can't even fathom, but like." Mm -hmm. The, for the rest of us, like, I remember when we worked at a casino, I remember watching people going in and out who know, highest percentage of people I've ever seen that don't wash their hands is in the casino. And other <laughs> well, luckily, it's not like all of their hands are going to go touch a bunch of communal objects that are then going to be shuffled together and then passed around to other people. Let alone paper money. <laughs> yeah. <That's laughs> the most, uh, <laughs> yeah uh, it's scary. And I, and I also think that, like, you know, how many times you've been at a restaurant or whatever, and you see somebody behind the cash register who is wiping their nose or coughing in their hand or whatever and this stuff, and then you're like, and that's how it spreads. I mean, I, I mean, we've all, not to say, oh, it's those fast food employees, but I'm saying is people who come in contact with a lot of other people or their food, that's because it's not just it's in the food, but it's in the wrappers, it's in the containers. This is how these things spread. This is very much how these things spread. And one of the things, too, is like we feel safer sometimes going to the drive through. But often what they do is they put the sickest person in the back so you can't see them. Um, I think that we need to think about like one is uh, workplaces are hesitant to let to send people home or whatever or give them pay them but send them home because you don't want it being abused because so, oh, I'm sick. I think I got it. OK, go home. Great. I'm short people. But we need to think about systems for that to like one. How do you know somebody's sick? I, I love the idea of like eventually coming up with some sort of test. that's like, hey, yeah, take this test, test this before you go show up on the shift today. And if you have if you have the flu. We'll pay to go home because we don't want to get sick because also the idea of liability, which I think a lot of places would want to avoid using it because of that. But I look at I think about the future of that, of how do we just if you're sick, how do we avoid contaminating other people? Yeah. And I think um, uh, there could be a world where. Um, uh, let's say let's say a third body similar to underwriters laboratories uh, that that tests all of the electronics. Uh, you, you can't sell anything at Walmart, Target, or any other major uh, uh, supplier that's an electronic item that isn't tested by underwriters laboratory. So imagine somebody does that, saying, um, "Hey, we've come up with a very simple." Uh, it's unfortunate that this is the example, but Gattaca style test where everybody who comes in once a week, you hit a thing and then doot, 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 and, it, and it just runs screens for all current flu or whatever. Um, and it's just, uh, there's Ugh. a little, there's a little, uh, let's say, let's say a red check mark. That means everyone who's working here today has been tested. Uh, and on an ongoing basis, you can rely on us. And then all of a sudden there becomes a financial incentive where it's like, well, uh, hey, if you're going to get hamburgers somewhere, make sure it's someplace that's tested. And then all of a sudden it becomes weird if you're not tested. And, and um, uh, along with running, uh, you know, similar to that UL logo, all of a sudden it, it becomes too scary to not get on the program and make sure that all of the human workers involved are, are, are not testing for illness every day. Man, I would not like to have a daily record of, <laughs> of my entire health owned by my employer or a third party company though. Yeah. I mean, you could, you could work in a, a some sort of safeguard because your, your concern is to say that like you, you don't want somebody who has the latest strain of flu handling people's food. Cause it will, you know, we lose thousands. I mean, we lose more people to flu every year than we do to like, you know, like gun homicide, like the number. And, and it's one of these things you talk about, like washing your hands and sanitizing would save thousands of lives. More people did that. We would, you would, the number of people we would save by doing that would be tremendous. Um, 
and not to mention other infectious things that we're we don't quite track as well or you know, know how they you know the rate at which they go from person to person so i could certainly see like you know if, if i knew a restaurant says yeah we do this and if they said hey because like you know restaurants will do this oh we're 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 you know gmo free which i'm like great you guys don't believe in science i don't trust you now um, it's, it's you almost know, like, like a bizarro reverse version of what i'm proposing it's just like exactly. we have an awful understanding of what really matters <laughs> yeah i i've you know, it's one of those things like where, you know, when I, I've seen like, like there's the court, so I think there's probably a correlation to the, the, the prouder a restaurant says they're like GMO free into their likelihood of having like, um, E. coli. Uh, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I think there's probably, I can think of one famous example of that. Uh, but anyhow, but like I could see that could say, Hey, listen, and here's our policy. Like if employee shows up and they're tested for something like this, we send them home, but we pay them, you know, we take it. We're not gonna, cause you know, these are people who are work you know it, it's it's hard because like you know if you're working minimum wage you know and you got the flu and you got you know you're working a low paid job rather and you've got Ooh, kids. this is interesting yeah. then you run into the dead cobra problem uh in places where uh i believe it was in india they had a problem with a lot of cobras or in other places they had a problem with rats so what they do is they'd offer a bounty for anyone who shows up with a with a, 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 a killed cobra uh Guess who starts a cobra farm <laughs> and mm -hmm. starts making them fat stacks showing up with a bunch of dead cobras. So you don't you would want it seems, uh, but you you you're suggesting that people would would intend to get sick. Oh, I so would. That... I I have done. Have done. Uh I I uh, mm -hmm. when I did want to go to school, I would I would actively engage like I would hang around sick people. Like I I fake sickness uh like but people when, who are working hourly or are working lower paid jobs would would yes any, would, anything any any per, I, I i believe any person is capable of doing this but i mean the upside but, is but, that, okay let me just get the other part of it because people are going to go to work sick and people are going to say that they're sick uh, and they go to okay, work. Look, i mean there's, there's uh, already uh, the uh your girlfriend definitely has the flu you definitely know you could get paid the same amount by not going into work you don't mind kissing your girlfriend uh, so uh, it, it, that would be a, a significant in incentive to just, and you know that your employer tests for these things and immediately compensates you. So you would want to structure the compensation in such a way where yeah, it rewards I, healthy behavior. Right. Well, I don't it, expect that like uh, in this fantasy that is all hypothetical, you would just get your entire day's wage, but, uh, well, Go ahead. It, remember, in cer certain sorry, sorry, certain things, you can only get like once per strain. And so the idea is you'd figure like, well, you know, you're going to test for flu. Like, all right, you got it. You infect yourself, whatever. We don't care. You're, you're allowed, you know, you're allowed seven days or whatever. If you get it, you can, you can, you can have as many dead cobras as you want, but strains of flu, you can only kind of get that thing once. Yeah. So, and, and keep you in know, mind, we live in a world where, uh, <laughs> where chicken pox parties are an actual thing. And now we live in a horrifying world where measles parties are an actual thing. And that is for the only theoretical benefit of being able to proudly say that you didn't have to vaccinate your child, not the highly tangible benefit of being able to save, of, of, you know, get paid to, to watch Netflix. You know, and then we live in a world where party parties are a real thing, where people just voluntarily give whatever they have to everybody. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, true. <laughs> I mean, you know, like what a cheaper like solution would be is just to like give these people sick leave and allow them to take PTO uh, or you know paid sick days off, so that they, when they know that they're sick, that they just don't come in, and well, then you don't have yes. to design a machine that determines Brian, that people are sick. Bryce, the 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 the, the problem is in that system which as exists and in many places is there is that somebody says great i will take my x number of six day sick days and then i go get sick after that they don't wait until they're sick to take the sick days you just take the sick days and then what happens when you've taken your sick days and you get ill you show up which is what most people actually do in many situations so mm -hmm. it, it's that it, it it gets into the problem of like so what happens in that situation where i already use my sick days for the year and I have the flu, and I use them. Maybe I was ill, whatever. But I, sh but I show up at work to work the line at McDonald's, and I've got the latest v nasty version of the flu. What happens? Sure. I mean, and I mean, it could be the same thing where if you use all your sick days and you were sick, and yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, there, 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 there. I'm not suggesting the be all end all, but uh... I, I'm saying that I'm saying that like in a case where some, my my situation is, if somebody shows up sick, like legit has sick, 
then yeah, you just pay them to go home. You, my solution is that because otherwise they're incentivized. You're, 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 the, I'm not so, I know that people will try to screw the system over. Far fewer people will try to screw the system over by getting sick, some will. More people, you know, and what we'll do in this system is that people self-reporting or deciding, and I have friends too, like, no, nah, I'm fine. And they're like, I'm like, they're clearly, they're not. They're coughing and stuff. And they're, they want to be fine. They don't want to be sick at this moment. And they decided that they're going to tell everybody that they're fine. And they watch them. <laughs> no, I'm fine. It's just a, it was some dry air. It was just whatever. And that happens all the time. And so the idea is, you know, using science to figure out like, hey, don't spit on my Whopper. <laughs> <laughs> Using science to say don't spit on my Whopper is a good way for uh, – uh, hold on. How can I segue this? Uh, if you would like to be able to – for us to afford a Whopper, why don't you head on over to patreon.com slash weird things. That's where you can support the show. Head on over to patreon.com slash weird things. You'll get uh, immediate access to our after things talk as long as we'll, uh, the full show. But most importantly, you'll be keeping us live, live, and independent. Thank you to everybody who is one of our beautiful patrons over at Patreon. Gentlemen, um, now that we've solved disease, ha! did you hear about uh, some people, so this novel sort of uh, cancer treatment where they were using um, some injections in light rays into the eyes and one of the side effects? Light rays? Wait, uh, you know what? I think we did. Uh, are you talking about? Uh, hold on, keep going. Wait, I think we did talk about this. Yeah, how I wild. think we might have talked about are, it. Are, are, are we talking about where there's actual photons being generated inside of people's eyes? The Cherenkov Yeah, this is the one where people were getting night vision. Wait, Oh, vision. wait, what? No, what? We did not. We talked about the, the oh, Cherenkov oh, effect. Oh. No, uh, please go. So there's a cancer treatment that was apparently giving people night vision, enhancing their night vision. <laughs> Now, how, how would that be? How much enhanced? <laughs> Brian's just like, how mild a form of cancer? Do I, have? <laughs> I mean, we just talked about uh, maybe I can go kiss my girlfriend who has cancer and oh, get and catch it. So using photodynamic therapy where light is used to destroy malignant cells, plus some other injections, one of the side effects they've had is people notice they had increased night vision. And... Basically, what they think this relates to is that uh, there's a protein in the eye called rhodopsin, which is one of the things which it helps our photoreceptors pick up light. And it may like increase like the number or the kind of rhodopsin that you have as far as picking this up. Um, and so that was the, uh, you know, the idea that, you know, because it's like, ah, you're crazy. You think you have night vision. And they're like, oh, wait, no, nope, this may actually increase night vision. So. So how much are uh, uh, people are self-reporting that they are having better night vision? How how much better night vision are we talking about? Um, is there any no. what is what is the vision? <laughs> I'm sure there's there's no unit for describing how good you can see at any given point. But um, yeah, uh, so apparently it was the how the many predators is, is it measured in? <laughs> That's thermal too, though. Uh, <laughs> as chlorine. Is chlorine E6 absorbs the infrared radiation, it interacts with oxygen in the eye tissue, transform it into highly reactive singlet oxygen, as well as destroying cancer cells. Singlet oxygen can also react with retinol and retinol and enable boost in night vision. The molecular simulation shows. So basically, it was the, actually it was the it looks like it was the chlorine E6, which was acting as this kind of like little kind of enhancer, this sort of like this stimulant sort of thing that's like makes uh, increases the you know the sensitivity there. Huh. And is it a permanent increase or just a temporary during uh, the treatment? I don't know. What are here? Um, so so wait, 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 we, we could talk about that in the theoretical. Is that something you would go in once a month and get a treatment just to just to boost up and have better night vision in general? It seems like a very particular. You would have to be a very particular person. Who is going out and doing stuff in at night, right? Doing stuff and going and doing. I mean, low I, would, I would say if you're a trucker, then that'd be right. something that you would want to maybe make sure to do, or maybe somebody trucker vampire. Maybe maybe somebody over a certain age whose night vision has been demonstrated to have degraded beyond a certain level. Hmm. I, yeah, I could see it's soldiers and stuff. For me, I don't know if I want night vision because, like, there's too much damn light during the day for me to sleep. So. <laughs> mm -mm. Well, that would be uh, – uh, oh, yeah, I wonder if it would make you more photosensitive to, to the daylight. During the daylight. Yeah. Hmm. <sighs> Daywalker. 
<laughs> well, and, and then plus also, like, let's say if the thing that you're solving is that you can't see very well at night, there's also sort of uh, technological fixes, obviously the biggest of which is um, – Lights. <laughs> we have things A called light. lights. Or literally Tell night vision more. goggles. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, if, you know, if you're indoor, you could turn on the lights. If, but outdoors, that'd be interesting. I wonder if that could be like a regional treatment for areas. Like, for example, um, uh, west of Austin is a town called Dripping Springs that has an ordinance that no lights are allowed to shine upwards. Uh, all of them have to have an umbrella that that reflects and points them down specifically to uh, because they they are aware that being on the fringes of Austin you you get better night viewing and they don't want to have all of the the light pollution. Mm -hmm. um, uh, no, yeah, yeah. Oh, you know you know who who maybe this would be helpful for. I don't remember the the name of of uh, the disorder. Uh, I only remember <laughs> this is bad. I only remember watching a horror movie about it and having a fun little featurette about actual people, but people who are uh, photosensitive to sunlight, right? People who uh, live in dark or yeah, at they're, night. They're allergic to uh, to the sun. Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like that would be a, that would actually be a group of people who might find significant use out of this. Uh, I just wonder, like, there's not a lot in here. Like, are people like, but uh, is regular light annoying to them now? Is it like increased photosensitivity to the point that like, you know, does that the trade off that you're like, ah, it's too bright out right now. And, you know, you're like, ah, I hate this. Mm -hmm. I don't like being a vampire. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, so, so how far, uh, yeah, I guess as a, it seems like all three of us are fairly lukewarm on the idea of this as a voluntary procedure. Yeah, just like, I mean, because eh. because what you have to do is have a laser get shot into your eye. I'm um, okay with that. <laughs> um, I I would be very hesitant about it personally. Yeah, I think it's one of the things where it's it's also sort of the problem with a lot of science reporting where somebody read the paper, somebody wrote a a, a article about the paper, then everybody else is basically abstracting from that article and without reading the original paper and to know more about it, it's hard. It's just it's one of it's a really frustrating thing. A lot of science reporting is that you realize they did not read the original paper because it's hard, and if they could really you know. Yeah. extract useful information from that at a deep level they're probably not a science writer yeah i mean so, we, we um, talked about we talked about that well you remember that well we talked about last week the underground uh wooden structure the oldest wooden oh structure? yeah i i there was another thing where and i think we both found these from science alert andrew uh mm -hmm. where like we didn't really get a good understanding of what the actual wooden object was uh from either the science alert reporting or the the news story that they reported it from or any of the other findings it's 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 really kind of a weird space for science news. Yeah, it it is, and it's probably you know we we you know, Brian's favorite example about uh, Michael Crichton and Marie Gilman looking at the newspaper, going like, "Man, this is poor. This section they don't know what they're talking about." It's like, man, it's probably everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, anyhow, we shall see a uh, little bit of a setback on space news, and that is that. Boeing Starliner, which is the uh, the two craft which are designed to return Americans into space from American soil, which is the Boeing Starliner and the uh, SpaceX Crew Dragon. Um, Starliner had a had a launch. We we're supposed to intercept the International Space Station. It didn't. That was sort of like a bonus sort of thing that it was supposed to do. It came back down, and there was like a there was a mechanical there was a, there was a there was a software issue on one aspect of it. And then they just realized there was another software issue on it too, or this got disclosed where they had to do an update on it or it probably never would have landed in the first place. So there's been a couple major issues of that. Oh, which wait, could wait, uh, be so, so, sorry, I, I, I think you're a couple of steps ahead of me. Um, uh, step one thing I'm hearing for the first time, uh, Starliner had, it, it was what, a test launch? Yeah, we talked about this before on a prior episode where it was supposed to go catch up with the space station 
and it didn't. It was supposed to do their test launch was it was supposed to go up to go into orbit and go intercept the space station. And it, there was some sort of uh, there was a timing error between when the engines are supposed to fire. So it didn't. And so it came back down. They said, OK, we'll bring it back down to Earth. Right. So that was that was problem number one, which was disclosed like you know a month or so ago when that happened. And, and, and come back down to Earth means let it just burn up in in. Atmosphere. No, no, no. Land. It, it, it parachutes all that because this is designed to carry astronauts. Got it. Um, they, they do the profile of like what would happen if there had been a mistake you know bring the people safely back down so it, it did that part it came back down landed everything was fine inside of there and there was this question of like well will they be able to now just go straight to carrying astronauts even though they had that little timing miscalculation and you know because they're like oh well, other than that everything's fine well it turns out there was another mistake that took place which was a software issue where apparently they had to load some sort of they realized there was a problem they had to update something mid-flight which could have been a catastrophic error, um, meaning loss of vehicle, loss of crew, if there had been people on there. Mm. So that just got disclosed like a week or so ago or two weeks ago. And that's now going to maybe affect the timeline of when Starliner carries people into space because NASA is probably going to ask Boeing now, like, no, we want another test launch. And so Boeing's already set aside, like, counted like a $400 million loss to sort of say, hey, we think we're going to have to do another, we may have to do another launch to satisfy NASA safety requirements. Mm. So it's frustrating, you know. Do you think that they, uh, what about it, just, just the fact that there was the failure and that there's a second launch? Or do you, th do you believe that the second test launch is, is maybe superfluous? Well, I think they need to do it. I, I think that there is... The, the the parts of Boeing that make airplanes and the parts that make rockets are completely separated, but there is this sort of fear, and that's the problem. They've been looking at what happened to the Boeing Max and the 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 process by which things move. You know, they use sort of their version of the agile method or whatever, which works great in some things, but maybe not there. And there's sort of a fear that there may be a more pervasive uh flaw in some of the ways in which things are being moved through and saying to, to their readiness, I guess. And I think that's absolutely essential. I think they need to do another launch before they put astronauts on there because they had the one mistake, that, whoopsie, we can fix this. And now like, oh, yeah, no, there was this other thing that went wrong. And prior they had a parachute thing where one parachute didn't deploy. And it was like, oh, no, we can handle that. And it's like there's, there hasn't been a flawless launch yet. So it's disconcerting. Um, SpaceX, you know, their, their crew dragons had, they were in through the same thing with Boeing, they're trying to get the parachutes to deploy right, all sorts of stuff there. They had when SpaceX went to go test the crew dragon, as we talked about before, after it had gone up, came back down, they fueled it up and exploded on the test pad, which was not a happy outcome. You know, in their defense, it was like, well, this wouldn't have happened when there were astronauts in there, it would have been after the fact, but still. Uh, was not foreseen. They had their last launch when everything went great. And so now it looks like May is when SpaceX may be launching astronauts on board the Crew Dragon. Um, so how, uh, uh, in terms of payload capacity, uh, do you happen to know how close the Starliner is to the SpaceX one? I think they're roughly equivalent because I, I think I think they both can hold up to like seven people as far as a tonnage. I They, I, they, I they look similar is, is the reason I asked the question. Yeah, um, I'm sure Bryce could probably, yeah, you know, probably get a more accurate answer than I can. Um, you know, and it's it's a thing where, you know, I want both to work. We want both. You know, of there, course, there is of like course. some of this. Yeah, and SpaceX forums will get into this like, ah, you know, it, this is a win for SpaceX. Like, no, no, it's not, guys. This is this is this just puts a lack of confidence one in, you know, man, space light, et cetera. And, you know, we, we want to have multiple options, all of that. So uh, it's, and I, I feel, and I, I can't imagine, you know, what it's like to be a Boeing engineer, to be some of the, the best people in the world of what you do and, and to have maybe just bad luck or just management along the way, just, you know, so. I mean, it's not like it's rocket science. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, so. The Starliner crew capsule can hold up to seven people or a mix of crew and cargo, which I think is 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 comparable to the Dragon capsule. The, yeah, the, yeah, the crew Dragon, I think so. Yeah. 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 So. And then meanwhile, separate story, uh, uh, over in uh, Baikonur, Kazakhstan, uh, uh, the the cost of, of uh, a Russian space flight has uh, quadrupled over the last 10 years. Is that right? <laughs> really? Four times Something. as much. Oof. Well, and you know, their defense. I mean, you know, they don't have a whole lot of customers. 
Yeah, and and it's it's market prices, folks. Um, you know, and then the reliability. You know that that that's that's the that's a proven system that that we know a lot about. So. That is one of the other weird things. It's like, uh, I mean, I mean, as uh, I don't want to be the one to jinx it, but a zero percent failure rate. That's extraordinary in a world where, you know, asterisk. asterisk. I mean, again, I said I, I don't want to be the one to, 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 to jinx it. And I guess also well, no, they lost one. The first test, they lost a cosmonaut. But yes, correct. Know. But I guess I guess since since uh, since we've been a customer <laughs> since yes. America has yes. been showing up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, that's the asterisk is that the the for the first guy to test thing got flattened. But yeah, it's been it's you know it's built in a lot of the best sort of Soviet ways, which is reliable, simple, uh, excruciatingly painful to do. And I, we mentioned this before, like, but it's a funny story. Was like when uh, NASA or somebody they were sending some satellites up on a Russian and on a Russian spacecraft. They said they got the tolerances, like it has to be able to handle X number of G-forces, and it just has to be able to handle like like six Gs. And the engineers contacted the Russians like, your your launch is only like four Gs. This is, doesn't make any sense. They go, oh, no, the six Gs is because of the train ride out to our launch facility, oh, which wow. is the middle of nowhere. That's where it has the most damage if you put a satellite is on that train. Go, oh, <laughs> so, wow. Wow, that's crazy. That's what do amazing. You fix? Um, I, 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 I want to dial back my pick of Picard. Wow. Previously. There's been two fairly soft episodes of Picard. And, I, and going into Picard. Uh, I liked it a lot. The first, uh, yeah, you really liked the first episode of Picard. And you didn't love the second episode, but our friend on Court Killers, Meryl, Meryl Barr, said, hey, maybe remember to treat it as a package yeah sit, sit through maybe some of the low parts to get back to the good stuff but yeah episode three is still not there no what, what's, what's the wrong addition with it? It... of of space wolverine didn't help much like uh let's just have a character that definitely looks like uh logan uh with a piece of shrapnel out of him and he's drinking whiskey and smoking a cigar mm-hmm. and he's like i'm gonna be your pilot it's the end of the third episode and we're finally putting a crew together Rrr, guess who i am professor x i mean picard <laughs> ah i didn't care i'm not having a good yeah. time wow unfortunate Ugh. well uh so we're that's gonna be your an anti-pick <laughs> well sorry sorry uh if, if i'm gonna pick i a, did the whole thing I, I i in my notes i went through the whole thing of like starting to put it down too. no i i i i don't know that i have much of a of a of a of a, of a pro pick you know what just put me down for a negative pick. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the anti-pick of picard i gotta pick i wish the show all the well but there are I have like uh, kind of like Google alerts in my head when a show is announced and certain things I hear, I go, mm, oh, for, oh, cool. Then I hear, I'm like, oh, and then certain words that are said and I'm going, oh, and <laughs> oh, then when the show comes out. You, you, know, you know what? I will give a, a, a pro pick and uh, okay. this is my second lap with what we do in the shadows that I'm watching with uh, my daughter, Josephine, who's uh, 12 years old. And we definitely watched a whole episode about a vampire orgy complete with the final scene where the door (laughs) opens and you see two vampires having passionate sex in the form of bats (laughs) um it uh it's so good is season two out now uh i don't i don't i no i I think it is uh, Wednesday, April fifteenth oh. is when it comes out. Oh, I yeah. see. Okay, uh, very close. Cool. Around around the corner. Almost, almost. Yeah, yeah that that show is great. Um, I still haven't seen the movie. I still want to go see the movie. The, uh, the original movie. Movie is pretty much the show, right? It's just uh, it's uh, it'll be candy. In fact, um, I would say save that as a treat the same way I'm saving uh, 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 Hunt for the Wilder People because I'm told that's very good, but I've never seen it. Mm. But and and I assume since it's Taika Waititi, it'll be great. Um, my, my the same daughter who really is enjoying what we do in the shadows uh, is begging me to take her to go see Jojo Rabbit. Um, oh yeah, I don't know that emotionally I'm ready to go do, do that again. <laughs> <laughs> is it? I still haven't gone. Is it still in theaters? I didn't even uh, realize it, it is. Be. It is. Oh, okay. Yeah. There we go. What we do in the shadows. I get a pick. Uh, over the weekend, I got a chance to play a little video game, and it was one that I had been. Um, I'd had on my radar for a long time and did not. Never found the right chance to play it. 
Um, but this weekend just ended up being right. And I'm, this is uh, a game called uh, Later Alligator. And it is a, it's, it's not a point and click adventure game. It looks like one. Um, but it is, uh, it's more like a mini game game. And so, so the idea is you, you uh, meet this uh, alligator, Pat. You're, you're, you're in Alligator, New York City, where everyone is alligators. And uh, you... Uh, Do people live in the sewers? Uh, no, they live <laughs> above ground. <laughs> and uh, Pat... Uh, we had a pet human for a while, but it started to grow up, so we flushed it down the toilet. <laughs> And uh, so you you meet Pat, who's like, oh my 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 family's my family's in the mob, and they're gonna they're gonna rub me out, they're gonna they're gonna kill me. Um, so I need you to go around the city and find out what they're gonna plan to do to me tonight. And also, it's my birthday, and you need to find out what the thing, the big, the event is that they're doing for me tonight. Um, and so you go around the city and you do mini games for people, and um, uh, and then the story happens. It's a very small story. It's a very short story, and it's only like eight dollars on steam right now um I, I i saw the true ending quote unquote true ending in about three hours if that gives you a sense of kind of how long it is but it's really well written the animation is really well done it looks great i mean it looks like an like an adult swim show which i realize is damning with faint praise <laughs> <laughs> uh, i i would say like it was a little frustrating getting to the true ending because there's a point where you're just like trying to kill time in the game because it's like a turn-based time sort of system but i i think it's i think it's really nice and really uh, a really good sh small it's a nice small experience We're looking for a nice small game uh later alligator cool i have a pick and you know i we've talked a lot about wuhan and virus and stuff like this and it can get scary and i want to take everybody's minds off that with just some like pure entertainment and so I recommend uh, the Steven Soderbergh movie Contagion, which is uh, it's convinced very, there's going to be well outbreak. <laughs> yeah. uh, have you seen this monkey? Um, no, uh, Contagion, which Contagion came out a long time ago, 2011, the ancient history. But what's fascinating about that is you had Twitter and you had most of what we recognize as social media today. So even though a movie that's almost 10 years old, it's neat to watch something where Twitter, you know, people spreading rumors and Twitter and all that sort of a thing. And if you've never seen it, I, I, I highly recommend it. Even And it's worth going back to see it because Soderbergh wanted to do a very realistic depiction of what if an extremely violent and deadly contagion you know, thing had an outbreak. And get this, starts in Asia. Um, uh, it was, it got praised for being pretty, pretty accurate. It's use of terminology. You're trying to show how things, you know, spread, how people try to solve the problem, the problems that are created. You know, Jude Law plays this wonderfully corrupt character who's this conspiracy theorist who's kind of pushing his own theories and stuff on it. Um, yeah, it's just a great cast. And also what's amazing about it is, and probably to the strength of Soderbergh as a director, he's able to get people on board where, like, um, no spoiler, because it's, like, happened very first, is Gwyneth Paltrow is, the like, the original person who spreads it. You know, and, you know, uh, Jude Law's character is basically kind of a bad guy. And to get, you know, leading actors to say, no, you're going to play kind of reprehensible people or you're going to do things that are just not likable is I respect those actors even more for doing that. Hmm. So, you know, it's got uh, at least three people who've been in Marvel movies. So that's cool. You know, um, I, I do that. That's my Marvel movie index is how many of these leads have like started together in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Marvel movies. It's a, it's a dumb thing I do in my head. It used to be like seven, six degrees of Kevin Bacon. But anyhow, um, I I think. Have you guys seen it? No, no. I don't think I ever did. Oh, please do, please do if you get a chance. Um, uh, it's on Cinemax, so you can do like the Cinemax trial sort of thing to watch it. But it was it was funny to watch. Like on iTunes, you had like pop up like what was the most watched like the most watched movies or whatever, and Contagion popped up because as Wuhan and all that started making news, people were like, "Well, I kind of want to watch something about this." So it looks like uh, it might also well be on Hulu. It may be on Hulu if you have Hulu. Uh, yeah, like with an add on. Oh yeah, you need Cinemax. No, you're right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Weird. But so. Um, yeah, that's yeah. Brian's that recommends the stand. Stan McMahon. That description in the beginning of the book about uh, the spread is is great. It's creepy. Well, that was probably like, that was like my first entry am I, level. Am I right? Uh, like... I think we covered on Cord Killers that the stand is going to be, I think, an Amazon original. Um, 
uh, a prime. Uh, there's some talk about that, or maybe maybe it was the Dark Tower. There, I, I could have sworn there was some version well, of the stand. Made too. And, yeah. and every every King property now is in play. So, yeah, but yeah, stand is being made. Too, <laughs> Apparently, so. somebody somebody cracked the code. It is possible to make a good Stephen King adaptation. <laughs> Quick, everybody, <laughs> do it again. <laughs> well, it's it's the, the the trick is doing it with things that weren't like the novellas, because like Shawshank was a Stephen King. You know, the bot uh, Stand by Me was a you know Stephen King adaptation. Adaptation. you know the, the 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 trick was you know yeah the longer ones but you know what's funny is like you do we talk about that going back and watching the t the miniseries version of the stand i can't let myself do that <laughs> <laughs> you know, some things hold up really well I I, I, yeah but 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 the walking dude as a dude in a perpetual uh canadian tuxedo you know <laughs> I, I don't know oh. <laughs> some things do not hold up well and that was an example of something i went back when did that come out originally like night I'm like, yeah, like 94. early 1990s were a special time because things we thought like our standards were so low. Yeah. Well, it, and I think it was 93 is when it was. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, there are some things you go back like, wow, this was way cheesier than I remember. Like I like I remember loving like the, the the TV movie version of of The Shining. And then I go watch this now. I'm like, holy crap. Like, yeah. Well, Rob Lowe. <laughs> Gary, Sinise. Gary Sinise. Yeah, fun times. You know what? That's my recommendation. <laughs> it's the, it's the nineteen ninety four. <laughs> not the new one coming to. Not the new one coming to all access. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, everybody, uh, wash your hands. It's been weird. Hey, there's a show. Everybody. All right, we're gonna take a quick break. Uh, come back for after things. All right, one moment till. Yeah. <laughs> Jean jacket. And, uh, <laughs> jean jackets are coming back a little bit. Uh, yes. Do you wear them with jeans? N no. You do if you're, <laughs> if you're evil incarnate. <laughs> if you're the walking embodiment of of malice and and evil, <laughs> then you do. Um. Outsider was good this this week. Good good outsider this week. You know what? I I think we're only going to be able to talk up to last week. I think I, I, well, well, I'm not entirely sure if I caught up or not because I don't remember which day of the week it comes out. It comes yeah. out on a Sunday. Then I didn't watch it last night. So, um, uh, that's cool. But um, we'll be able to talk. I mean, because Tom finally got on on yeah. the train. Um, I think well, this is this is we've got we're, we'll talk more about this on Court Killers, I'm sure, but. Probably, I don't know how much how much meat is on the spoiler in time bone left for the new pope. I actually but, thought this episode was I, all I, right. I, but I, I don't want to spoil it, but he just goes and visits the dude, the sleeping pope. Yeah, that was the entire plot. That's the big that's idea. That's the entire. Oh boy! Oh, and he visits famous people and talks about how great it is that famous Man, people come visit him. Barely, Manson got fat. Uh, it was a it was a very good it was a very good bit for Marilyn Manson to go and meet the Pope and then realize he's met the wrong Pope. He doesn't even he hasn't even met the one that he knows. Well, and I don't know. That's an. I mean, I mean, uh, f f forgive me, but as a as a boogeyman to scare parents, Marilyn Manson is fairly toothless now. Okay. So it, it's 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 equivalent to watching Ozzy Osbourne from the early 2000s when he's more known as the doddering dad. Um, again, not that not that Marilyn Manson is doddering or whatever, he does a great show and all that stuff, but 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 uh, none of us are, n no parents are scared of him the way they were 20 years previous to that, you know, mm -hmm. 30 years previous to that. Um, so as a result... Uh, but I don't think he's meant to be played for shock value. I agree, but I do feel like they ever so slightly leaned into like, Ah, uh, Marilyn Manson meeting the Pope. Isn't that crazy? And I'm like, not really. Oh, really? No. It's not that crazy. I guess I, that's the part that that I'm like, what what am I getting out of this? Also, and then, more and then, Meghan Markle references. Oh, we are, Jesus. Why are so, we? Okay, and with that, okay. I'm going to go to the rest. Hi, Andrew. <laughs> Hello there. So, she's not well. I, I, I walked away. Oh. A, a criticism about uh, 
denim jackets and you just can't wear them with jeans, right. then what do you wear them with? With the slacks. Or... Baggy shorts. You know, What's that? Yeah, baggy shorts. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. uh, that, that, uh, that uh, there, there's a fashion is cyclical and uh, we're finding a new, a new form of retro uh, making its way on the internet. Yep. 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 Well, uh, I did want to bring this up because I could, of... I, I, because I, I wasn't sure. It's very hard. To, it's it's very hard to determine how authentic someone is, something is on TikTok. But um, I was on it over the weekend, and someone had posted. You know, it's mostly just like high schoolers trying to be funny or do dances. But at, for some reason, it gave me this video of like someone shooting video outside of their apartment across the street, and it's clearly in in it it is almost certainly in china and you see like these two people standing on the sidewalk and they're crying and they're talking to these like officials and you see them like walk them into this like truck they're like it's like a pickup truck with a little shed on the back of it and you can you supposedly can hear them like wailing uh, uh, in the back of this truck no idea when that was taken no idea where how 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 much of any of it is real but it was just the thing that made me go Ugh. Yeah, it's hard because it's like, you know, our need for information and then our own problems are confirmation bias. Because I know that, like, shortly when Wuhan started making the news, mm -hmm. you know, things making the rounds, there was the Indonesian fish market that people said was the Wuhan market. But I will tell you this. I have been to markets in China and ain't much different. But mm -hmm. um, and then you see something that was like posted out there like, ah, oh, look at these government officials, you know, breaking up like a public game. And it's like, no, they're actually breaking up a game that was like suspected of gambling or, you know, cheating, fraud. And it's like, mm -hmm. not that you, you don't, you don't really need to invent, you know, uh, things of the Chinese workers, like, you know, interfering with people's civil liberties and stuff there. It happens all the time. But yeah. yeah, this thing here, we're looking at the people in the buddy suits, medical workers, detained Chinese couple in metal box, like maybe maybe right know. and the fact you that know. this is on on youtube uh versus because tiktok is very weird in terms of like there's definitely a large amount of like stealing videos that goes on so uh yeah. you, you never know like if something's old or authentic plenty of stuff is obviously not authentic yeah yeah and it's hard because it's like that like I said, we, we we're dealing with a country that is notoriously the most restrictive ever you can imagine about social media stuff <clears throat> and information's locked down. And that's one of the things kind of the our press doesn't do enough to, I think, explain to us is like one we, we like everybody knows like, oh, they, but like literally to what extent that they get told by or the Chinese government is like, no, don't talk about this or whatever. And, you know, we we're, we found this out after like the Iraq, the the Iraq war in 2003, which was uh, how often we would go do and we would, we would journalists would go to inspection sites or go to places like this and report the official party line because they did not want to have their access in Iraq revoked. Hmm. And so they were comfortable saying this. And so that's one of the problems you deal with here is how often do American journalists tow the party line because they don't want to lose access, not just access in China, but also economically and, and you find yourself in this gray area where you can say no nah, i think we're okay to do this whatever it's you know it's like the you know movie stars that will clear you'll clearly criticize any injustice or anything they see as long as it doesn't affect the second largest market for their movies in the world <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know? uh, yeah they're, 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 yeah man it's um <clears throat> a world out there yeah 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 uh did you are, are were you interested at all in uh the netflix lock and key show that they just put out are you are you on I, the lock I've and been key following train? the rotten you know the development i think for years to see what happens i've been following looking at the rotten tomatoes sort of thing to see like is this a thing that people really like and then all want to watch you know oh yeah how and I, I, and I and i mean like i pay attention to audience scores now like a critic scores on tv to me are garbage for yeah. stuff hmm. you know i found that because like critics were often they're using a way different measuring stick but i look to see like so i it's got what it's only it's got a small group of people watching right now have you watched it i watched the first episode and i did enjoy it and i think i will probably watch the rest brian i know watched like four plus episodes and really did seem to enjoy it i think tom liked it yeah. too so we yeah we, i'll check it out 
Yeah, it, it's it's. Um, I I don't know the original uh, graphic novel. Uh, it, it, was it a graphic novel, right, or was it a novel? Yeah, I just I never read it. I just remember following the development of that for years. Um, it was more. Um, it was a little more like a CW show than I thought it would be. Okay, Kill Kilmer Rock says it was a graphic novel. It not that not that it's like cheesy and cheap because there's definitely a lot of money in it, but. It, it definitely feels a little more like teenagers than I thought yeah. it would. Um, but I think it's cool. It's neat. Um, the first episode... Um, the first episode does the thing where a lot of like really unexplained stuff happens. And I have yet to see whether they're going to explain everything and it'll all wrap up in a nice bow. Or they're going to say, oh, yeah, it doesn't matter how any of this stuff works. Which I think will be fine yeah. if they handle it right. Yeah, there's the we're getting to the point where there's a lot of stuff out there, but the quality is now, you know, there there was a lot of the early streaming stuff. First, it was a little rough. Then it got pretty good because you were getting the best showrunners and best writers and doing stuff. Yeah. And then now a lot of the same people who are doing just OK TV and not to, not to say this about Lock and Key at all. I don't think but a lot of people who are just doing sort of OK TV have come over here and they're making kind of just OK sort of streaming shows. And I've seen that like. You know, we talked about another show, which I won't mention. Um, as soon as I heard who's attached to it, I'm like, this is going to be crap. Like, this mm. is like, I will like, I will like, you know, yeah. name me, you know, name me one great thing that they've done since they got that award for that thing. Name me one great thing. I was like, has it? And you're like, oh, we got this person involved. Like, and then what have they done in TV or anything else? Like their name's been attached to tons of stuff, but name the, and there's a lot of that. You just, and it's amazing. Cause like, I've seen this up close where. I'll be in a meeting where somebody wants to like acquire a property or whatever like this. And it's like, oh yeah, you know, we've got a deal with such and such, this writer who worked on this show. And I'll be like, I'll be like, what? Like that show wasn't good. Mm. Like, ah, oh, but the ratings were good. Or, you know, they were part of this, this group of writers that worked on this thing. And I'm like, like that thing, like had a really great first season because there was nothing on and the same people were second season. It sucked. Like why? And they did this, this, and this, why do you think they're good? And it's like, well, you know, we're excited. And in this, you know, you sort of like mentality of like, like I, you know, I don't think it's hard to figure out like who the who really good writers are. Is you can have good writers on bad shows, but then you look at like, oh, when they overhear, they're do great. And so, Hollywood's weird. It's really weird because then like, oh yeah, well so and so did a deal over there, and they did it like, yeah, and that fell apart. It did crap, and you know, like, and sometimes it's like, so and so had this big deal at Universal, and now they're working us with this on this TV show, and you're like, that sucked over there. It's great that you've got a big time film guy working with you, but what makes you think they're going to make this good and it's not uh my surprise things that i actually enjoyed sure which i didn't please. think was carnival row what's that no please carnival row have you watched that yet no but i heard that's good that's on that's an amazon prime original right yeah it was i thought it was delightful i thought carnival row was delightful i enjoyed it it was a very neat world they created um it felt like it was something like out of a series of books but they just wrote this for that that series i thought it was really fun it's 87 percent audience score right mm -hmm. some of the best streaming stuff i've been watching the disparity between the audience and the critics is huge hmm. the witcher you know as we talked about the witcher i thought was um we're not recording this right we're right. just like on two birds some blank here i think from a storytelling point of view i think the witcher may be better than the mandalorian oh Ooh, wow yeah, you The Witcher was, was, I mean, like, it's, I'm not going to call it a surprise hit, because, I mean, The Witcher as a series as has its success as a book series and as a video game series, so it is uh, no surprising that there would be some magic left in that old top hat, but uh, I think the fact that people are finding ways to latch on to it and, and uh, really get attached to it, make it a good sign. I mean, we talked, we've talked on Cord Killers, CordKillers.com, uh, about um, The Witcher possibly being, a, quote unquote, Netflix's first franchise, um, mm -hmm. which is there. You have to put a lot of asterisks in that sentence. Well, I mean, why not like Stranger Things? Uh, well, that that see, that, I'm saying you, there's a lot of asterisks you have to put on that, but yeah. that because they're already planning spinoffs and stuff of The Witcher where they are not for Stranger Things. Yeah, uh, the comment somebody made there, I see you made about, like, yeah, Witcher has that that jumping in timeline sort of thing. Is is You get why they did it eventually, but it is a little disorienting to a degree. But it's mm -hmm. you get to the end of it. I don't think uh, it, it is a fair crit, but 
I don't think it's a, you know at all a deal breaker. But and, and um, I think I actually made a mistake. I, I th this Verge article says that Netflix is looking for franchises and yeah. they are uh, Netflix is investing heavily in Witcher and Witcher spinoffs and they like an animated show like lots of stuff. And so, like Ken from yeah. Chicago is saying, like House of Cards and Orange is the New Black, but like, a yep. they only kind of yeah, they did it like, and yeah, it is. I guess yeah, to the point of not disfranchise, but really like a a, uh, a uh, universe. Universe. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I thought I I enjoyed it. Like I was re hesitant. I watched the I watched the audience reviews for it. Were really first you see the critical reviews and be like, eh, hey, look at this show sucks, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you see the audience really likes it. And then some people you know said, oh, it's good. And then I watched like, it's a really enjoyable show. And like I thought it was way more consistent than Mandalorian, which I enjoyed. And it's also like we're it's like it was kind of like Mandalorian. We're afraid to criticize because we're afraid for Star Wars to go away. You know, we like like I don't I don't want I don't want Star Wars to leave because Star Wars can be good and Mandalorian had a lot of fun stuff in there, hmm. but a lot it was so inconsistent for me a lot of it. But I'm looking forward to season two. My niece had a is so loves Baby Yoda. She had a Mandalorian like sleepover party. Aw, that's cute. So, yeah. which I'm sure we're gonna get a Baby Yoda cartoon or something out of that. But um, oh my gosh, Baby Yoda adventures. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know it's um. It's it's a, it's an interesting time. Um, uh, I don't know. It, it, it's it's an interesting time for shows. Um, yeah, there's. I, I still there's, have so I have so much. I, I started using. I've talked about this before. Um, this app called Tracked, uh, which which keeps a track of like shows that I'm watching and when there are new episodes and stuff. Oh, um, cool. And um, I uh, it, it's really helpful because I can just sit down and be like, "What is the thing I should watch?" and it gives me all these options. Um, but uh, there's hey, there's a lot there's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of stuff to watch. Well, yeah, I there's a lot, and I, I've I've just noticed just the trend has been like my favorite shows have been often been the ones that the critics were the ones the critics loved and the audiences didn't like. I didn't like, you know, like I just feel like there's just a weird split between that. Um, but this year like we in 2019 speaking retroactively like witcher was a delightful surprise carnival Row was a delightful surprise and the boys you know oh sure those those were just like and those were things i did not expect to like that was like a big surprise like those were all three things like i didn't think i was gonna like and things that i was looking forward to mm. not because i had such high anticipations but just ended up being kind of the showrunners and the people the way they ran it were just some of the biggest dis disappointments yeah you know, I uh, we, we do um, we do that the, a year end segment at, for for Cord Killers um, over the over the new year where we rank all of our favorite shows and stuff from the past year, and I just have so much time or I so much difficulty, a difficult time, uh, just even remembering stuff that I watch. You know, mm -hmm. it's um, I was I was, I was um, similarly uh, I was talking with someone about um, about 2019 in video games and. Like he asked me, like, okay, well, like, what was your game of the year? And I couldn't think of one game I had played in 2019. Like, I just, I yeah. literally couldn't even think of any of that because there's, there's, there's a bunch of stuff out, and oh, I should see this. I hear this is good. I, this doesn't this, interest me. I, you know, this, this reminds me kind of. You watch the season finale, Good Place? Yes. Kind of like, like, uh, spoilers are already there. I won't spoil too much, but like, my my criticism of that was sort of like your the experience you're going through that was like, this season finale this series finale the episode it told me more about the state of mind of a showrunner reaching the end of a show than kind of their views of the hereafter yeah because it was just the idea of like ah what are we just gonna do everything we want that's what my idea of heaven is and, but then you know you can end it any time i'm like oh, this, i think you're missing the fundamental aspect of challenge you know the idea yeah. that it can end is not you know to me the definition of human life the idea of challenges but you know it's just that kind of idea of like Ah, what if I could stay at this resort in Palm Springs forever? You know, like, yeah, there was that mentality of like, you know, um, I was looking at that going, huh? But the idea of like, you you have you get to do so much sort of stuff that all runs together. Yeah, nothing special because everything's cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it is one in a long list of really weirdly unaddressed things about just the the entire setting of the good place, where like, yeah. uh. Um. Ooh, okay. We we 
uh, Brian is going to be just a little bit longer. He had a little, a little bit of a small emergency come up. So I'm happy to talk to you, Bryce. Yeah. And, 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 and our, everybody out there. And he says, maybe we start without him. So maybe if we, we'll give him another couple minutes and then okay. we'll just start a after things. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but yeah, there are a lot of really un, a really, a lot, a lot of really interesting unanswered questions about the good place in the world of the good place. Like mm -hmm. why suddenly we've just we've only now realized heaven and hell are uh poorly designed uh like yeah. it, 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 the whole like uh, the, i don't want the more i get into it the more i'm going to spoil that final finale so i'm not, not going to do that yet but yeah. there's there are a lot of really cool like uh, metaphysical or sci-fi stories you could tell in that world and they avoided all telling any of them <laughs> I, I agree. I, I think that there was so much more potential. And that was the last couple seasons was frustrating because I thought the potential for show where you thought once you, you, you realized the conceit of the first season and where it could go, I thought was exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I'm ex I'm glad the show exists. I'm glad. And it was, it was such a d different it's sort of thing. And I, you'd have to take you know somebody like Michael Schur with the track record he has to even get something like that out there. Mm. I want more of that, a show that talks about philosophy and, and ex existentialism and all that sort of stuff and, and the idea of how to be better. It was great. Well, that was great. You know, like, and like, you know, I'll ding it, like I said, for the things like, I was saying that, you know, my, my summation of the final episode of Good Place, Brian, is, I knew more about the state of mind of a showrunner reaching the end of their series than I did about their views of the hereafter. <laughs> like, like, what if you could stay at this Palm Springs resort for the rest of your life? Ah, no. I just want to know that I could leave at some point, you know? It's like, you know. Yeah. I miss the idea. Like, when I think about life, I think, like, yes, we know we're going to die, but that's not what gives me meaning. It's challenge. But. No, I, uh, I had pitched what a bold and audacious thing it would have been if the last two parts were, spoiler alert, if anyone's watching the show, uh, an indictment of the very nature of the afterlife, where it's just like, why are we even having a middle phase? Like, if the whole point is you live, you die, you're judged, and then you live again until you get bored of it and then die, like, what if they just destroyed the afterlife? That would have been bold and interesting, but... Uh, they didn't. Yeah, but I don't. I don't think that's the warm and cozy, hopeful sort of thing they wanted to do. <laughs> you know. I, I mean, I agree. Uh, uh, they they were so into the goodbyes that they made four final episodes and then ran them all in succession. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I was thinking like like if we made the one that like what do we really think about the hereafter? Like here's where it starts. The show is over. <laughs> Wait, <where'd laughs> they... No, no, no. Like, no, there is none. It's sorry. It's it just, you know. No, it, but, but I mean, once they did that, that uh, next to last episode where it's like they, they introduced the idea of the exit point, like, I mean, you know, you sort of think through, it's like, well, then what's the point? Uh, you know, if everybody's eventually going to get there anyway, what's the point of this middle stuff? You know, it'd be a wild, bold yeah, take. Yeah, and I... And I I, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, I, I we were just talking, Bryce talking about like things we could have explored, and, and I was thinking like the thing that I thought like, man, the thing they didn't address, which maybe it's a Hollywood thing, but like the thing I would think they should address is the idea of like having children or or taking care of somebody else, the idea of taking care of another person and helping them develop and reach, and that's to me was like a fundamental idea of like what is life about well it's because it, it got to be very self-indulgent like oh, i'm gonna do this thing i'm sorry i love you but i'm gonna go now because i'm bored of you <laughs> i was like wow that's sort of weird but the idea of like hey now i'm gonna enter this phase where i'm gonna look after another human being or another life you know a child an old person whatever and help have, have them. that moment where the entire focus shifts to it's not all about you dummy 100 percent. yeah exactly that would have been interesting yeah. uh but, hey know. hey i'm a little bit short on time for okay. today's i apologize i might even have to bolt a little bit early but what, what time do you need just, to be out um ryan just gets up and leaves right now uh, uh 345 yeah oh you know what bonnie's calling right now um could 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 you guys i, I well, don't know if you got my text bryce yeah we, we'll um, start we'll, yeah, start we'll just start with that you just yeah. go and uh let us know if you're coming back or not sure, how about sure. that okay or just don't just don't we don't <laughs> Uh, all right, then give me one second. I'm gonna swap our spots here. Boop, 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 boop. Hey, look at that! All right, you ready to do this? Yes. All right, then uh, let's go for the After Things podcast in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the After Things podcast with your hosts Andrew Maine, that's me, and Mister Bryce Castillo, that's me. 
We may have a special guest drop in, a Mr. Brian Brushwood at some point, or maybe not. No maybe. promises, no promises. No if we can't get sure. him on this show, I'm sure we'll get him in the future. <laughs> so, Andrew, I had a, a project. Of course, uh, of course, this would be the week uh, when both Brian and Justin are uh, dis- are deposed. Um, I had a hair over the week. So I had a hair over the weekend to... I had played some video games. I play video games. Well, you had a I, hair. Wait, I, where does that expression go? Like a wild hair. I had a wild hair. That's it. Where was this wild hair? Uh... <laughs> Well, it's and so it's I jumping uh, around your living room. A wild hair from outside got into your living it room. It got inside, and I had to catch it in a big Tupperware container. Uh, got it. I I I had you poked holes, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I I, re- I released it. It wasn't in there too long. So I um had played a few video games. I do some of the video. I play some video games here on Twitch on Twitch.tv slash Night Attack. But I also obviously play stuff offline. And I had posted up in the Discord some of my thoughts about these video- various games I had played, some of which I would not play on stream ever, um, or uh, uh, some stuff that I did play, but uh, it was late at night, and they were these really long, you know, five, six-hour live streams. Um, but I knew, but I liked writing down kind of my impressions, and I've always had um, an inkling to do some sort of like video games-related project. Um, I, behind the scenes, I had been working on um, uh, uh, possibly a podcast idea or, uh, you know, people, obviously, there's a whole written community for writing about video games. But um, I just had the idea, like, why don't I just do a newsletter? I do a video games newsletter and once or twice a, a week, uh, talk about uh, games that I've played uh, uh, talk a little bit about news because there's n- news coverage for video games is so saturated, but you know mm-hmm. key key stories. Um, but I I the thing that I am looking for because I think it can become other things. I think if it, if this email newsletter was a bigger thing, it could become a blog or it could become a podcast or some sort of video thing. It could be any number of offshoots. But for right now, the things that I'm looking for are ways to take a newsletter and treat it, it treat it proprietarily in a way that you couldn't for a podcast or a blog, right? What is a way that I could use a news li- a, an, an email list like this that is not just the normal one way? Here's my podcast. Listen to it every week. Uh, one, I think it's great. I think that like, I don't listen to as many podcasts as other people. I prefer to read a lot of stuff. It's uh, for when it comes to long form books, I like to walk and listen. But podcasting, often there is uh, getting to the heart of what the big things I want to get to is often hard. And so I like the idea of what you're talking about there. I think a newsletter is a great idea because both you know we've talked so much about you know there's getting attention and there's retaining your audience and having people's every every week or more getting that newsletter in there and maybe they don't read them all but they know that they are there and they have them and they can read them at their at their leisure Mm -hmm. and i think that this is a a, a, i think we've talked about this in some form or another but the thing that sort of kind of struck me is it's like yes there is tons of video game coverage there are few video game stories there are few you know and a story is can be anything from the story of the creators to the story of somebody experiencing it and that's why we have watching people streaming you know playing games and why twitch is so big Mm -hmm. is because we we want stories or experiences with these things and i think that i think it sounds great you know i you look back in like the mid early 1990s every newspaper had somebody writing about movies there was one of the biggest things that happened on yahoo and other news sites was they would have movie bloggers there was no shortage of people giving reviews of movies then harry knowles comes along And with ain'titcoolnews.com and creates this site that's like way big, deeper dives into movies. What's it like to be somebody who was more like us at that point than a reviewer getting into it? His experience with the movie, what he liked, what he comparisons and stuff and whatnot. And for for a period of time, you know, it was was the best sort of movie commentary there was, even in a world where we were filled with movie coverage. Yeah. Because it was. uh, And and we've seen in the video game space a very large rise of of people doing documentaries about games mm-hmm. either after the fact or while they're being made um interviews in studio time technical stuff like that has blossomed in the past 3 4 plus years and um but but i i 
And so I, I am seeing that almost as its own. It's not oversaturated, but I see that as a much bigger, a much bigger deal than what I'm looking into wanting to do right now. Um, but, yeah, I think that it comes. Oh no, go ahead. Well, but, no, yeah, I think I think you're. You don't have to if you have a if you want to like I started writing books because not because I'm like, man, there are not enough books out there. You know, I, I wrote books because I wanted to write books. And then the second choice was, well, what will make my book special or different? will be like, well, I'm going to write the kind of thing I want to write because you know, there's not enough. Like I spend way more time looking for things than I do reading things. And, you know, I, I, I think, man, like there's probably a few people like me that will like this kind of stuff that if, that, that might click. And I think for you, it's, I think it's a great choice. Yeah. So um, how I, do I subscribe? Uh, how do I, how do I support this? Yeah. So I have a, I have a link at my website, neshcom.com. There's a, a, a button that says games newsletter. It'll take you to the sign up page. Uh, and it only asks your email address. I don't even need your name or nothing. And it won't be a lot, you know, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, election season. And my inbox is being hammered by a certain uh, a, a certain senator who just really needs four dollars from me. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hammer your inbox like that. Um, but I I I um I'm trying I I'm in trying to think of ways that that we can use this because I'm trying to think of ways that that I can use this that you couldn't use a podcast or a blog to do right. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, I think my first initial idea was like, uh, trying to have a bit of a dialogue, right? Kind of, kind of what with Justin does. I know he does this on the politics show, uh, the politics podcast and a little bit on jury where, you know, he will put out a question and then, uh, solicit, you know, people's, um, you know, response, feedback, mailbag stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and I know with mail lists, you can make it a very direct, uh, you know, like I know when when Brian has his sends out like scam stuff emails, uh, if you respond to one of those promotional emails, it will it will send that email back to Brian and it becomes like a one on one conversation. Let me tell you my thinking right now on newsletters sure. is that I think we are going to see the next not the next, but a major not quite maybe Facebook level or Twitter level or but maybe a, a MailChimp or something level company come out who's going to solve the idea of how to how, a really great way to interact and create and do content through newsletters. Mm -hmm. MailChimp, you know, has got a lot of cool services and tools and things like this. And like the sign in form that they had for you, it was, was a slick sign in form for your newsletter, whatever. Yeah, I think that's good. And MailChimp is doing a ton of stuff behind the scenes for making it easy to track campaigns and stuff, but they're, they're more like the, I want to sell you kind of newsletter or campaign stuff. And I think yeah. somebody who says, yeah, a newsletter is a way to engage or whatever. I think there's a tr something, I don't know what it is, but I think there's so much potential there because I think that is, you know, in a noisy environment. Agree. Oh, let me, let me well, confirm this for you. There and you there go. was a, uh, Oh, thank you. There, there was, um, popular information, right. Uh, is, is a similar thing. This is, um, uh, Judd, what is your what is your last name, Judd? Uh, there, there's a journalist who does some political reporting, and he has a newsletter. But he has a free <laughs> newsletter where once a week you get a story or an article or whatever. But there's like a paid, uh, like a premium subscription newsletter where you get more emails a week. And mm -hmm. and I think it's really interesting because he like the the reason I found out about it is because he has broken. A few news stories recently um and i think it's it's a really interesting um idea where you just because we're so used to like paying for netflix or paying for even podcasts right and extra podcast content that email almost seems almost seems too easy almost seems too easy to make a premium thing hey brian yeah but and i think that's why it's, I think it's one of those in front of people, but we don't acknowledge like, like I think in, in, like that one's going through Substack, which I've been following. And I think, like I said, I think, I think it's a great idea. And I, I think that there's so much more, I think it's because emails are so unsexy is why people haven't, there hasn't been a lot of energy in putting it into like improving the stack, making it easier to do and monetize as much as could be done because I don't think it's, and also because 
there's so much money to be made right now in sort of the more you know selling you stuff email and not so much the email as the content yeah idea. so uh, uh brian to, to catch you up i'm i'm starting a mailing list uh about video games content and i'm i'm looking for ideas it, it wouldn't it would i mean there would it would it would be slightly promotional a little bit of like hey uh the streams or the vods or whatever of, of when i play games um but i'm i'm trying to think of ways that are novel uses of email that you couldn't do with like a blog or a podcast the biggest thing is here's what i noticed with email is there is a reasonable expectation of being heard when you respond to an email that is orders of magnitude different from leaving a comment on a podcast or a blog post or anything like that. Uh, when an email pops into your inbox and it has, you know, from Brian Brushwood, for good or for ill, people hit reply and they're hitting a, you know, that's not my post to comment button, that is Gmail's reply button. And then they talk as though they're talking directly to me, which sometimes is pleasant and good. Um, and, and other times makes people feel, uh, emboldened to, to shout the things that they would say if they were passing me on the street, if it's, you know, if they're having a negative moment or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, so I would say whatever it is structurally, maybe figure out a way to take advantage of that where it's like, um, uh, like for example, if you were, uh, if you were to email blast everyone, uh, text me or, or, or reply to me with an object that is in my house. And if it's in my house, I will send you a picture of it immediately. Um, like as a bizarre game, then, uh, people will immediately engage and they will believe that they're actually talking to you in a way that they don't believe it with uh, uh with tweets with uh, uh text messages with blog posts with any of these other things um and having said that that's the highest level of believability that i've seen but even then i i'm astonished at how many people when i respond to them it, uh, maybe maybe one out of 20 people say um who is this is this you know are are you Brian Brushwood's media guy? And it's like, <laughs> no. But 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 the other 19 people really do believe that it's you and they believe that they're talking to you. So mm -hmm. I would say what uh, But I, I don't expect that there there would be much barrier in my specific use case. I think most people knowing uh, signing up would know I'm I mean, that's what I would like to lean into, right? Is like if that's a facet of it, then there's not even what? that one in twentieth person. They know that there's uh, uh, I guess a dialogue. Options. Right. You don't. Oh, go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd say that. And like, I, I think that, that the engagement that you get back, like Brian pointed out, is such a wonderful asset of that is that that what's nice about email is my way to respond to you is the format of the thing. When we do a podcast, we want people to talk to us. We're like, oh, go email. We got to tell them to go into some other format or medium to respond to us, mm -hmm. you know, and the the beauty of like what was great kind of about like, you know, Facebook and Twitter to an extent was the, the, the way to engage was the medium. The problem was, is that everybody could respond to you. And then that sort of anonymity or, or everything else kind of crept in. But an email is because it's it's like a podcast for your eyeballs in a way. People get it in their email box. They look at it, and then if they want to reply, they just click reply and say, "Oh yeah, Bryce, this was my favorite thing. I like this thing." And now you have all this extra content. Do Do you know what the single most if if we're going to measure purely on uh, engagement metrics, the single most powerful email moment I ever had in my entire life was um, me trying on the experiment of of what I've heard call uh, called the uh, the six word email. Uh, which is like, keep it as short as you possibly can. And I think I, I think I wrote out some version of, hey, what's your favorite thing in the scam stuff store? And then uh, I got over 4,000 emails in response. And each one of those I responded to individually. Uh, and and uh, that does two things. Number one, it 
it reminds every single person who replies to you that they're actually being listened to, which is very important because if this is uh, uh, email is a two way relationship in a way that podcasting is not, the blog post is not, that Twitter is not. Uh, 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 Twitter theoretically is a two way relationship, but even then it's sort of, you know, you're, you're, you, you feel like you're barking from the back of a very large crowd. Um, and so it was important that I respond to every single one of them, giving my thoughts on their thoughts and so on. And, uh, but the other thing in this is possibly the more important part when it comes to maintaining the connection between you and the audience member is it trains the algorithm to figure out the difference because much like YouTube has an algorithm, much like Twitter now has an algorithm, Facebook certainly has an algorithm. Now emails, all email providers have an algorithm by which they filter out like, okay, I know you signed up for this at some point, but you always seem to ignore it. So I'm gonna put it in this place where garbage goes. So I'm not really gonna show it to you. Uh, they respond to it, which is important for their experience on the algorithm, and you respond back to them, which is important to let them know that this truly is a two-way communication. So I would say whatever you could do on that end would be extremely valuable. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, and that's certainly, as you scale and you're worried about the deliverability of it and all that, and that is that is sort of the, the, the frightening thing, but um, I'm... I, I do like I'm I'm ex I'm excited you're doing this. I just retweeted that was what I was typing. I was actually retweeting this out there for everybody, Bryce. Oh, so, thank you. Uh, in case I looked distracted, it was just everybody <laughs> check out what Bryce is doing. Um, I think it's a very cool thing. I'm curious to see where you evolve it to, but like that the feedback, like Brian said, is like getting people's response can be such a neat thing because it'd be like, hey, let's put this week's top ten. What are you playing? Whatever. It's a really what's nice is that you could do that on a blog, but you're gonna get you know you're gonna get everybody and 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 the spam issue is so huge we don't have that and the, there's not such a big spam issue with people responding to email <laughs> you know mm -hmm. um, well, and, and also think, there's no benefit to grandstanding because if you post a response to a blog in the comments you ostensibly are responding to the author but oftentimes what you're really doing is you're making your own micro platform as lord of the hot takes in the in the comments but with an email there's no benefit to that there's nobody who's ever going to see this response to the email except for you the the intended target so i think people speak a little bit more candidly and directly and and i suspect honestly as as well in those in those situations and and i suspect that there's some benefit to that as well um hmm. I, I i have one more question i i know a lot of the emails that you know skim stuff does are are generally single um uh, single objectives right like hey we got a product here's the email about the product um where what i would like to do with this and and it'll bear out over time i guess but i i, I would like it to be multiple little things right i like to be okay here is here is the hot news story and a short take or an explainer about it. Plus, here's an impression of a game I've been playing. And then here's, at, like, it's it's multiple things. And I know that the uh, the subject line is super important when it comes to email. Um, do you? And and this is something that we we get up uh, we we talk about a lot when we uh, are like publishing YouTube videos. Is is what's the best hook for people? But in when it comes to email, is it the opposite where more is better, right? If you have more things in the subject line that gives people more hooks to, ju to jump in or do they want one big thing? 20 years ago, I think that a collection, a roundup of things you care about was a very good idea. Uh, and people were actively excited about signing up for newsletters. I, I think those days are past. I, I think that now you'd be better off if you ha if five things happen during the week then there should be five hot takes that are very short that you would send out over there and five emails uh five emails because what's the worst that can happen somebody can leave in which case guess mm -hmm. what they were never really part of your fan base anyway they were never in, uh really in there like like um uh i think i think Justin does a daily political newsletter sure and 
guess who signs up for that? People who want daily updates, right? So whereas, um, but uh, I don't, I don't see, I, I don't love being inundated with emails. Like I don't, I, I think, I, I think I'm re still kind of subscribed to Justin's uh, email list, but I know I don't check it every day. That it's, it's too much. Right. And that's fine. I, and Justin would not be served, uh, eventually, um, uh, Justin is not better served for you to pretend like you're reading it all if you're not. And likewise, you are not better served if you convince yourself that w your once a week, you know, Bryce's thoughts, weekly roundup of the video game news. Um, if, if they're not watching, you want them to burn out as fast as possible and you want to dump them. Uh, I... It, Go ahead. I, I, that, I mean, it might be two different kinds of audiences, though, because like I'm on the like, I shut down everybody who overfills my inbox. Because when I can't keep up with stuff, I can't. I unsubscribe. The ones I like are the every every you know when I get a Matt Ridley one every couple weeks, read through that one. I I, I spit, set aside time. I'm gonna sit down through there. If I got his Twitter feed in my in my email inbox. That would be that's Matt, but anybody else, it's a different story. And I and for me, it's and it, like if Justin's on the campaign trail and a lot of hot takes to be taken in Iowa or New Hampshire, that may be one thing. But like I'm I, like Bryce is like is Bryce described this in my head like man, you know, I would love like yeah weekly. There's this really cool Bryce long takes on stuff, whatever. That I would love because otherwise, like yeah, I'll just follow you on Twitter. And it's and it's not a rigid. I I mean we 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 didn't. Uh, I guess maybe it, it's not a rigid like on Thursday. It's the third. Like it would be, uh, you know, possibly a couple of times a week. Like it would be flexible to allow for breaking news stories or or, or what have you. Um, but I, I don't know. I I I I think it. I, I it almost feels like the use case because it's. I'm not really trying to sell much of anything, at least right now. Um, and, and so I, 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 I don't like, I want people to read. I want more people to read because I don't need to churn through people and keep a high percentage rate. I would, I, I, I don't, does that make sense? Um, all, all, all of that emotionally speaking, I, all of that resonates. Um, I know that there is a, a feel good aspect to your numbers staying high uh but touch of modern when you sign up for that and again this is a marketing thing not a news thing um when they very intentionally hit you three to four times a day because you're only one of two types of people you're either somebody who wants to buy a touch of modern thing in which case you're thankful that they are hammering you as often as possible with the maximum number of opportunities to buy touch of modern stuff or you're not, in which case you're taking up their bandwidth, you're costing them more from their uh, expenditure or whatever, and if you're not really meaning to be here, then maybe you just need to move on. I, but I those would, people, I would those say, people could casually go to the store and just shop when they want to shop, right? I mean, that's that's the off route. There is not that you lose a customer; is that they go and do it on their own terms. Sure, uh, uh, sure, but. Uh, I don't know that you're offering a very different thing because there's only two categories of people, people who want to hear Bryce's opinions on video game stuff, in which case they want to hear the maximum number. They want the maximum number of opportunities to hear Bryce's opinions on video game stuff, mm -hmm. or they don't really belong there, in which case they kind of need a, yeah. I, 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 so like, I mean, I'm going to dissenting opinion. I want to hear... I, I want to hear Bryce's opinions on things that he's like, because we're talking about before the difference between coverage and stories. And the problem is, is there's ample coverage out there. Everybody's covering stuff. And sometimes what we want is more stories is we want more stories about things and stories are harder. They're not as easy as coverage, but I read stories. Coverage is disposable. I want Bryce's stories. Like oh, I went to go play this thing. This is my experience. I don't need Bryce on the floor of E3 or anything because those hot takes are everywhere and they become kind of like they're, they're commodities. They're sort of there's there's a surplus of that, and it's why I I don't follow as many people on a lot of things because I just like great. I got your garbage take on this thing. I've got a thousand others. I, I, Give I, me a story. I I actually agree a hundred percent. And I suppose what I'm what I'm leaning in towards is um, 
if it doesn't merit an individual email as a thought, then I'm going to guess it doesn't merit any place in a roundup of seven thoughts in there. Like if it's a garbage take, it's a garbage take, and it's not made any better by being scooped up with six other takes that may or may not be garbage uh, so that we could feel like there's a roundup of a thing. Well, and, and round, like it is, this is not going to be heavy on news at all, which is why I wouldn't want it to be. This is why I'm kind of pushing back a little bit on like every news story or every one, every thought needs a thing because there is so much coverage, like like Andrew said, of news that it would not be a news newsletter. It would be more Im- impressions or reviews or what whatnot. Um, I guess I guess let me turn it around back to you. Sure. Um, let's take news completely out of it. Okay. Um, let's say it's, uh, let's say I had a newsletter called Brian's thoughts on magic that was published before 1970. And that's the subject of the newsletter. Mm -hmm. Um, sign up right now. (laughs) I, I, uh, pitch me on why it would be better to have a collection of four of them rather than four individual ones. Because if it merits your attention, it merits your attention. And if you've signed up, then uh, it seems like, uh, like, like, I, how is four essays collected into a monthly newsletter better than, than uh, 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 four emails of one essay each that's weekly? Uh, I, oh, Andrew, did you have a thought? Well, I, just, I get like John Hawks is a guy who covers like evolutionary uh, evolution, biology, stuff like this. He's been involved in some kind of stuff. The way his thing works is I get a bunch of his stuff all at once, which is actually I kind of like it because I, when I'm in that mindset to read about this subject, a lot of it like I forget. But when I read, I'm like, OK, I get this kind of cool. Now he's going to talk about this discovery over here. And I kind of like for me, I kind of like that grouping because. I don't want to be thinking about that stuff every day, but on a Thursday, do I want to do a deep dive for half an hour into that? I kind of like that. And and I also like too, it's like Bryce, like you may be hearing two different people telling you that our subjective choices on how we want to consume stuff too. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, just bear that in mind. Cause it's like, yeah, you I know, mean, my ideal and Brian's ideal are, you know, and, and, and my, my thinking of, of, why putting smaller smaller pieces together is because there would not be much long form content. Like it, it, it would be more occasional if there was say some multi paragraph review, right? It would be quick, lots of quick hits, um, or or fix adding in having community stuff, or here's upcoming stuff, and and trying to keep flexibility with those smaller modules so that whatever each thing is it can have these small opportunities to be wacky without this huge commitment of here's a wacky email um you know yeah, i i and i think that's a good point is to recognize your own personal bandwidth because if truthfully at the end of the day the answer is i don't have the bandwidth to do this every single day yeah that's that's a different issue than than that 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 is an important bryce focused question that you have to answer Mm -hmm. uh not uh to 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 my mind a a relevant uh audience focused question yeah i mean uh having a soft limit of like one to three emails a week was one of the first thoughts in 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 the project because because there's only so much i can do and i want it to look nice you know i mean when i even when i was doing um, like the music, the playlist newsletter podcast, like it took a lot to put those together and it ended up being, I couldn't really keep it up every week or, or every month. Um, then in, in that case, I would say, um, I mean, I guess it's almost like an zine sort yep. of mindset. Great. Yes. Got. Yes. Like, in great. which case, in which case, uh, uh, lean into that, like, mm. like, and, and, and I, I don't think there's a right or a wrong way to go about it. I think there's different objectives. Yeah. Uh, and I think that, that, that Andrew and I are offering different sides of the spectrum on there. I think the most important thing I just heard is, you know, the Bryce bandwidth factors into it. Um, in that case, train your audience to number one, understand why the format is the way the format is mm. and explain, um, yeah, you know, um, again, because we live in an algorithmic generated everything, uh, maybe even bake into it 
like, uh, uh, hey, reminder, this is this way because this is how much time I have. These are my thoughts. Hmm. Uh, if you truly love this email, respond with the word pickle and then go, off you go. And then everybody will respond with the word pickle. Because I, I think Justin does a little something like that where he puts a, a algorithm fooling like, hey, train your algorithm by responding to this with oh, interesting. whatever your favorite thing is. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah. Um. I think that on the subject of putting multiple things in there, I get some long emails from people and the thing they should do is do summations, some summations at the top. Mm. And I like the idea of a hey, blank here, blank here, blank here, you know, keep it simple. Sometimes people just go overboard with it. And to be honest, you, know. you could do worse than full on rip off the format of axios.com where each thing is a headline, a two line summary of your hot take, the words go deeper that allows me to either scroll past it or go deeper. Mm -hmm. uh, you could do worse than exactly what you're looking at right now. Hey, uh, yeah, it, it, this is the, this, this Axios, especially the sort of front page of like new, uh, you know, uh, headline objective and then the critical thinking like that. This is like the size of the bite that it would be. The, the other thing I guess I'm thinking of because I've been reading it a lot the past like six months is uh, do you know Daring Fireball? I know the name. Mm -hmm. uh, John Gruber. Oh yeah. Yeah, Check John John Gruber. He is a uh, he 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 writes about a lot of different tech things, but a lot a lot about uh, Apple stuff. And so his blog is mostly like, here is a link to uh, this news story, and here's a small quote from it, and here's my small take, and here's a hat tip, and that's the post. Yeah, and he'll do occasionally long, longer written written pieces, but a lot of it is very low uh low activity um mm -hmm. reblogging basically the, you know? uh i actually think that could work really well for an email format the only thing i would suggest you add is at the top of the email something that says what's in this email like oh, sure i have yeah, yeah. i have three judgmental takes on uh things uh, one pitch for a video game that doesn't exist and a blank. And mm -hmm. then like, like in one line, I now know like, well, I care about two of those things. Oh, this must be one of the reviews I don't care about. There's another review I don't care about. Oh, yeah. here's the hot take I was looking for. Here's that pitch I like. Very good. Oh, it says here, respond with the word pickle. So I'll do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. Well, I'm glad I could, uh, I guess, make the case for it in, in, a, in, in a way similar to how I was envisioning it because I mean, we, it, it was very funny signing up for the MailChimp account because it's very much like, all right, so are you selling products? No. Are you trying to generate leads? No. Are you trying to get people to your <laughs> brick and mortar business? It, it no. Just, it just goes to a page of a monkey going, what are you doing? I don't know what to do. Why, why are you yeah. even here? I'm the MailChimp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For you, uh, for you hopped on, Brian, I was explaining that I think there's a huge opportunity there, or maybe as you were, it was a huge opportunity for a company to come out with something specifically for this kind of thing, mm -hmm. because so much of what we want to do is, no, I just want to share information, like maybe market something sometime, but really just, yeah. you know, communicate. Um, it's it's funny because uh, I, I have felt for the last few weeks, uh, uh, due to bandwidth limitations, I know that, that um, uh, my email list uh, is, is, in a deficit of just catching up. Hey man, what's going on with you? And, and, it, and, and I wonder to some degree if, if that's not coloring my, my opinion on this, because I am aware that, that I'm short on bandwidth and, and, uh, I am certain that number one, we're paying way too much money and emailing way too little because at $800 a month for our current MailChimp list, Ew. it's a crime that I only sent out three emails over the last month. Uh, and, and granted, all three were associated with product releases, which people are accustomed to the idea of when Brian has a new product, he's going to reach out to us and says that. Uh, says, uh, er, But you want give and take. Well, with, I, I, with I, selling I, number stuff. one, I don't want to feel like I'm spending $200 per email <laughs> to send them out. Uh, so at the very least, I want to reduce that on a per email basis. But along yeah. with that, I want to I want to associate in their minds like, oh, it's an email from Brian. Is this a funny joke? Is it a, a story from behind the road? Is it an important news update? And and uh, it's funny that that's kind of the perspective that you're taking, because for me, I am almost using this as like uh, the the thing that I am missing is uh, uh, is a platform to just 
put words out for this stuff, right? I do, when I do stream games, I try to finish them. And then that just means like, if I have any thoughts, it's usually immediately after, and it's in the 10 minutes at the end of this seven hour Which is video. statistically speaking, the very the least most watched. unpopular part yeah. of it, right. And then it just kind of gets lost after X amount of months and Twitch deletes it. Even, even but then you... I'm not gonna make a Facebook account making long posts. I'm not, I don't really wanna get into like a whole big thing of like making a medium uh, account because it's, I don't want it to be prim, I don't want it to be proper. Well, and Let's, let's say a video game is an eight hour experience. I would love to get an email that says, Hey, I played a game. Here's an, not even a YouTube video. Here's an animated GIF of the best parts of the first 90 seconds. Yeah. Here's the craziest moment animated GIF that happened in the minute, or maybe a, a maybe not. What are some of the, the GIFy like things that have audio? Well, yeah, one of those, you know, like 20 uh -huh. or 30 seconds. Right. Sure. And then, and then you're like, uh, and then, you know, here's the ending of the game. And then here's the three minutes where I give my thoughts. Also, if you don't want to click on this, my thoughts are this. Like, mm -hmm. that would be ideal so that I could take what was an eight-hour experience for you and in about three minutes feel like I got the gist of, of the Bryce experience on that. Yeah. I like, yeah, I like that. I And I like the idea of using GIFs that are actually original content. Like, I... I Man, you follow trends from emails, and like one was the emoji trend. Where like I knew I was getting spam when there were emojis. But the emojis in the subject line. I'm like, man, that's what spammers use. And sometimes like people with legit emails started doing that. But I'm like, that's a bad trend. And then oh, that's a gifts. good question because like, uh, Mailchimp says like, hey, don't use too many emojis. I think when you're setting your headline, but you you would prefer zero emojis. I I just know when I see an emoji, it's a marketing email. That's that mm. somebody's. It's immediately I see somebody's trying to sell me something. Man. And what like, I always do is I always say, you won't believe how good this is. <laughs> <laughs> Laughing, crying emoji. Is it, should, yeah. should I stop? I, I title every email that way. <laughs> should Man, I stop well, you, that? <laughs> Brian, if you, said, if you said you did that, I'd be like, well, nobody has more experience that I know that about this stuff than you do. So nah, I'm like, well, I'm pick it up on what you're putting down. Three fire emojis yeah. afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How they know My other hot. thing was, <laughs> we, have a, we have an acquaintance, mutual acquaintance, not Justin, somebody else would send, e would send emails out. And they were doing the thing of putting the animated gifts in there, the random gifts, the thing. And I'm like, I hate that because it's like it reminded me of every dumb sort of like lifestyle blog where, oh, we're excited. And then the excited gif and this I'm like, that's like it's annoying. I'm I'm distracted by this thing that's not content to what you're doing. And it's there to like it, it's there because somebody looked at the heat map of some effing blog and said their eyes went here and we're getting readership there. And. You know, I uh, we, we we did a little bit of that uh, in the early days, man, six or seven years ago. Like we might say like, hey, man, let's blow this thing and go home and show a Han Solo jumping through a, yeah, that's a, fine. a door door thing. Mm -hmm. But but nowadays, uh, especially on a product thing, um, I, I always carve out carve out the six. You know, if if the product at the end of the day is uh, a, a phone vanishes and appears in their hands, then show me an animated gif of the phone vanishing and show yep. me their amazed face as they look at their hands. Yeah. Yep. That's, and that's on, con that's content. That's con gifts as content. I think are great. The idea of like using the, the random, you know, gif things to put in there. Just like, that's, you know, that's like, also, I don't think we me. did it on this. I, I, I was just totally pulling out that email. And... I, uh, this yeah. is uh, <laughs> this is another one of those bandwidth things. Uh, what we did instead is, and I do think this was interesting. We launched a product, and we did include a link to our announcement video of the product. But I actually think that the most compelling part to buy the product was to go watch this unbiased third-party review. Of, of the product. Oh, really? And and he does like a 30 minute review of it. And he comes away with these are the upsides. These are the downsides. And we made sure to uh, to 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 paint it red and 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 talk about those in the email. Oh, so, clever. that's nice. Yeah. So yeah. so likewise, I mean, keep in mind, because that's something that I would also like to do is like, hey, here is here is good reporting or here is here's a good video about right. games like yes third party content but 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 also linking. maybe maybe even consider taking say here's a link to the full third party con, con content but if there's one line you should hear and imagine cutting out from their third party review yeah. with a here's a gift you know it, with words underneath yeah. you know so or, or or a 30 second snippet or whatever mm, 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 mm. 
that that's a really good idea yeah i um because i i hadn't considered like how much is uh, this this is more of a technical question but how much is uh gifs and images a, a concern when it comes to like bandwidth like Ooh, other than bandwidth. get ready for this uh -oh. if you subscribe to a service you don't have to worry about that bandwidth i mean because uh -huh. it's all going to be hosted on third party whatevers but also uh I, I know that you have spent a decade training your brain to respect copyright and respect <laughs> takedown notices well and also like the, all the 56k warning email go you go nuts you do whatever <laughs> which is funny because that's that's the most fingerprinted way i could do it yeah, yeah. But, but again what are they gonna say like please take down your email no they can't <laughs> yeah all right cool this is this is this is really good information i feel uh much better oriented uh, to start this, uh, because I know when when I was when I was setting it up over the weekend, I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna make the Mailchimp account for sure. But then, do I want to have a website that also archives all the stuff? Because I know with Mailchimp you can get permalinks to letters, but like, do I want to have just a backup blog or something? Do I, I like? I was starting to get in my head worry. about a million other things, and I need to just do the emails first. Worry about the email, and I will if I can give a piece of advice, which is Brian and. I don't want to use the word schadenfreude because it's not quite what I feel. When I look at my $80 a month MailChimp bill and I'm like, ah, I'm not using it enough. Ah, I, like, well, over any year, if, if $1,000 a year, am I glad that I have it? I'm like, yeah, it's, I get a more than $1,000 a year use out of it a month. Dear, you talk about an 800 one, you made me feel a lot better. Uh, yeah. um, okay. <laughs> well, and, 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 and by the way, um, uh, I'm sure your imagination. I mean, I don't know. I'll say the numbers. Like, uh, it turns out once you have a hundred thousand people on your on your email list, like we had to purge fifty thousand people, uh, and it wasn't because we didn't want to try to reach them. These are all authentically well earned people who signed up for the email list. It's just that uh, you know who doesn't want to spend four hundred more dollars per month uh, on emails that don't appear to be opened. So we ended up. Um, Basically, if nobody had opened a single email for the past year and change, we put them in a special list and we said, hey, you're about to be deleted. Just click on this picture of a hamster falling down a hill if you want to stay in, like literally do anything. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I don't know, 7,000 of them responded or whatever. And But then of the remaining 33,000, it's like, Good. hey. No, for reals, we're about to delete you. Do nothing if you want to be deleted. And then uh, even then, we didn't really delete them. What we did is we put them in cold storage, and whenever we feel like it, we can add them back. But don't worry about that. But but, yeah. but we're no longer actively emailing them. Mm -hmm. But but yeah. but again, I mean that the, look, those are good problems to have. Turns out <laughs> when you start doing email lists in 1997 at every live show that you perform, uh, you get to a place over over 20 24 years <laughs> oh, sure. where where you know uh, you yeah. you have to worry about an $800 a month on, beer. On, on the flip a side, beer? <laughs> a, a, a bill <laughs> or a beer, an $800 a month beer. Could you imagine that beer? Uh, on the flip side, I went to go log into my Mailchimp account because I had done the that sounds not cool for for a while, uh, and it couldn't it wouldn't log me in, and I was so confused why. And it turns out that they will delete your account if you don't use it in over a year. Ooh. <laughs> but I really I, I I I just it would just would have been credentials thing. I I don't entirely know I was gonna get those. But that people. that so, actually is a good point because you want to have everything backed up and archived in right. such a way because you know it's con I mean, places go belly con up yeah um yeah you can download i periodically download my email list from them so i have it uh, um and here's the thing it's the thing to think about too was that like i was stressing out because part of it was every time i went to go see and send an email through mailchimp like i think their functions if i was doing regular marketing stuff and all that i think their functions are great but man if i just want to send out a quick update or whatever it was a pain in the ass i got in the habit of getting used i got one of the like email by email sort of links so i use that a lot i just email you can get like a email to an account at mailchimp and have it resent to everybody else so i can just do plain text oh that is one of the weird things that you i think the new reality I, I i don't know if we're part of the problem or the solution but uh, mailchimp has been fairly liberal at pointing out how many people have not opened your email and explaining that they will never open your email unless you resend it again right now. So, uh, really, 
Yeah, yeah, and and statistically speaking, just I mean, a time of day thing, or no? It's a, a, a first of all, the odds of a hundred percent of everybody opening your email is exactly zero. So after twenty four hours, it comes back and says, um, "Hey, man, ninety one percent of everybody on your list did not open your email. Now's a good time to resend it." Just click here to resend. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see the same thing with Twitter, which, again, this in all of our minds as consumers triggers our, our spammy response. But I think that's just the new reality where it's so, like, uh, do they uh, does it, it? It doesn't reserve it. Do, it. It reserves it to the people who also clicked into it, too. No, it, okay. it, it, it will send it to it, it automatically segments everybody who did not respond to it. Now, okay. truthfully, the that that alchemy is not 100 percent precise either because what they're doing is if a picture is opened then it's a special version of the picture that allows them to track if there's a thing that is clicked on it's a special version or whatever in theory every email is downloaded and somebody could open an email in such a way that mailchimp would never know it but if you're using any of the major services like you know hotmail gmail and all those it would be a report it's, it's going to be able to know whether or not it's been opened i'm I'm I every now and then I I look at like some of these services that make it easy to just put your own build your own email service like on Amazon S3 or whatever like this because you look at the, the prices there. I am afraid that I'm like one a couple weeks away from a weekend project of just building my own service. Just uh, to because send of my or to receive? To send, just because of my frustration of like what I pay versus what I get. And but okay. Uh, remember what you're really getting is the expertise because this is the other thing. They know all of the best practices because I used to use a, a program that would individually from my own computer, create an email, send it, stop, some create an email, send it. Stop. No, no, no. I mean, I mean the Amazon S3 service that specifically has the white label listing and all that built into it and Got all it. of that, 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 that you're right. Yeah. Cause the other way, like, yeah, I used to do the way that, and that's don't, you're, you're better Might off as well that, just throw it away. Now, yeah. Yeah. There are like Amazon has their own service, which people who do, cause like you, cause the position you're into Brian is like, you're at the point where you're afraid to grow because of the cost of that. And to be honest, you're almost a borderline point for you to hire somebody part time to sort of run a system. You might be more advantage. It might be better off for you to do that because I mean, my God, you know, yeah. Look, eight hundred dollars a month—that's almost ten thousand dollars a year. There's somebody out there that probably has a homegrown something that that would, yeah. If if they could if they could prove that they could reach as many people as Mailchimp, then at that point that that sort of alters the that alters the deal. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Mailchimp, Mailchimp, like, is amazing how big that company is, and part of it is the 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 fact that you kind of got locked into it. That was sort of the beautiful sort of thing is the lock in is the idea of like I gotta go somewhere else, but everybody else is sort of priced kind of the same, and they've added a ton a ton of functionality. But I'm and at they, the point where like, man, they also have done a pretty good job of maintaining a healthy reputation. I I mean, I would say <laughs> yep. the 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 majority of what you're buying is is in general they don't truck with bad practices uh, and, and oh, they yeah, do a good job of, yeah 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 and and, and I, I, like it, it, oh go on, no, go ahead. It, yeah if i if it was my full-time job and i knew what the hell i was doing i would say it's a much I'd, i would get more out of the there's a lot of value to be have there but i don't deprive derive as much value out of there because you know my i'm just a simple country chicken <laughs> well and, and, an and also like i've made the pivot into uh commodity launches whereas everything you're doing is a hundred percent your original content yeah like like I, I don't think i've ever seen you send out an email push for you know a, 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 you know a coaster that you just found on aliexpress yeah uh oh i can do <laughs> like that though. Me. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and like you know I, I i mentioned earlier i think that you know i am definitely open to Spinning off into other ideas as need be, right? Like writing up an email like this is basically all the notes you would need to do a podcast version of it, or yeah. some sort of bloggy thing. Like there, there, I'm I'm open to 
monetizing it. But right now I just want to have some fun with my friends. Well, and keep in mind, you never know when the idea of a lifetime is going to hit you. And, uh, you know, we talk about the three currencies, story, attention, and sales, right? This is you cashing in sales in order to get people to sign up so that you can reach them or whatever. And as you provide value in the new story of Bryce talks about video games or whatever, Mm -hmm. at some point, three years from now, you, you, you'll have that epiphany of, Oh my God, I figured it out. It's the perfect, uh, high school robot dating simulation. And, uh, 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 it probably already exists. I guarantee it exists. It uh, doesn't. It robot. Mm. Okay. I, I'm gonna say. I'm the gonna say. The point is sixty percent yes. The point <laughs> is you're gonna be very glad that you've done the, the, that. You've laid the groundwork so mm-hmm. that you can actually reach everybody when that when that moment comes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm I'm excited for it. Thank you guys for the good words. Email us. Uh, okay, yep. now, but answer yes, no. Would you like to go to the transistor ball? <laughs> 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 I'm looking for a metric date. <laughs> mm. Question, are you AC or DC? <laughs> <laughs> Check yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, my pick will be MailChimp. I got to go pick up my daughter. I love you guys. Bye. Okay. <laughs> uh, Andrew, I've got a pick. I, I bet you... No, I bet you you I would bet dollars to donuts you even know it. Um, there is a very good um, iOS and uh, iPad app that is now on Mac called Drafts. Do you know Drafts? Um, I'm sure I played with it, but I don't think I've seen it lately. Let me see. And I, and I think they just had a uh, an update. Re- I think I think they updated pretty recently. But the no, idea I don't behind know this, but the idea behind Drafts is that it's a it's a text editor. It's a mark. It's got Markdown. I think you can add like coding languages and stuff to it too. Um, but the the conceit of it is like, hey, anytime you are going to write something on your phone, do it in drafts first. And mm-hmm. it has all of these like out- outward actions where like, okay, you want to write a tweet, open up drafts and write the thing, and slide a thing over, and there's a button that says tweet, and you click it and it tweets it. Um, uh, you want to make a grocery store list to do that. Like I, and, and the problem is I'm only like about a week or so into it. Cause I'm, I'm using it to keep my ideas for the, the newsletter in. And I'm still trying to figure like, I can tell that there's a lot you can do with it. There are workspaces mm-hmm. and automation, all sorts of actions you can do. And I have, I am completely above my, uh, above my head uh, in it, but it seems really cool. And as I've used a few different markdown editors on iOS and, as far as that goes, I think it's pretty good. It's got a very customizable action bar above the keyboard. Um, it has tagging. It shows you markdown syntax in uh, in real time. It lets you preview stuff. It can. There's a special mode okay. where if you if you keep links together and you put all the links in the thing, there's a button where you can just view the document and tap on the links and not have to like tap on the thing and then tap on the thing again and go in. Like it it, it seems very very well thought out but I don't know all the ways that they expect you to use it. So side note, um, you know, the connection between John Gruber and Markdown, right? He, the daring Firebell. Uh, he, is he, he's not the inventor of, yeah, he created Markdown. He is. Okay. Cause I know I've yeah. been, I know I've seen, I, I've never, I, I guess I've never looked at the full story, but I knew he was very integral to it. Uh, yes. Yeah. Mar- and Markdown's Mar- great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm looking at drafts. I'll tell you what I like. Um, I mean, I don't know much. It's got great reviews, but again, these days, I don't know what to believe. They're doing the subscription model, which is sort of the standard, right? Now, the, the upside of subscription models for developers is that it's incentive to keep the app going because the problem is if you have a super popular app and you sell a bunch of copies and everybody buys it, and then after that, you have a slow amount of adoption rate, you're de-incentivized to develop. But the problem is a lot of developers price their stuff st- Stupidly, you know, I've seen like, oh, we think we're worth six bucks a month. I'm like, I'm gonna use a notepad. I've I've seen that. I've had some things that I really like to use that were like writing apps and stuff, but then they did. Um, I'm not gonna name names right now, but I they <laughs> then priced themselves in such a stupidly high rate that I'm like, this is your. I would not, you know, to ask me to pay this every year or whatever. You're, it's an absurd rate, and I think they've had this problem because like, ah, oh, we think we're worth this, like. Yeah, but it's not about paying what you think it's worth, what the market will bear. Yeah. Here, they're doing monthly, but it's two bucks a month, and it's like twenty for the year. And yeah. if it's if it's if you get as much utility out of that, mm-hmm. twenty bucks to try a writing app, yes, perfect. I'm like I'm, 
I, I'm curious to try out this. And and uh, I, the reason, the thing that got me into checking this out is that they had the developer of drafts on um, another really uh, good podcast due by Friday this past week. And just hearing them talk about like, what are your actions? How are you, like, there is, I, I think drafts has a good reputation, which uh, uh, helps support a subscription uh, style model like this. But it really does seem to be more fully featured um, and worth the idea of saying, instead of typing your text anywhere else into your phone, just type it into this app and it will remember it and it will save it and it will do, it will send it out in a smart way. Um, I think, I think it, uh, uh, it, it, it walks the walk. So uh, drafts, I think it's very cool. And the free version, you can do a lot with the free version. Um, mm -hmm. um and and it seems pretty cool. I think the stuff that you would get is extra and auto automation stuff, uh, workspaces. There's a whole like inbox paradigm of, um, I, I don't even know, but there's an inbox. It has its own inbox. So uh, drafts. I think it's very cool. It's on all the Apple stuff. Yeah, I'll take a look at this. I like it. it's on all the platforms. I'm you know excited. And I'll tell you that the encouraging thing was that their their pricing model was just not. I got to pull up. I got to look at just, just out of curiosity, something else there to see. Um, and that's the, the next big thing is also like to think about like, where do you, where does your data live? You know, where do you get to store stuff? Because that's one of the things often is we, we get these things that we really like, mm -hmm. and then we don't know where they live, the data lives. And so for me, like everything goes to a Dropbox. I try to make every idea, every thought, everything is backed up onto multiple computers. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's the thing I'd suggest to you. And I brought up the idea before um, about like why I like to use the right to email, like, you know, where I can just with MailChimp, oh, a lot right. of service. And, and the reason I bring that up is you talked about like, you know, doing the blog, doing everything else like this. And the problem you get into, as you know, is that sometimes it's you have the things that you want to write or you want to do, but it's the action of trying to express those things that gets very frustrating. Right. It feels like you are yeah. getting in your way once you have to start thinking about H1 and H2 tags and start thinking about like it's it's the problem of editing while you're writing um, too much. Right. Where you think you have to be writing linearly um, and editing linearly when in reality your mind is thinking nonlinearly and is thinking about many disparate objects. And the point of writing is to organize those objects and so that it can be readable. Yeah, and you get into just like when you go to do an email, because like that was my frustration. Mailchimp, like, ah, oh, I gotta send, tell everybody I got a book out and open a Mailchimp. All right, create a new campaign. Mm -hmm. You know, now choose the template. Now drew this, and I'm like, I just want a photo of my book <laughs> and the text. You know, I and a link. I, oh, that's all I want. And and that was sort of, and I get what they do is great for like if you want. I want to put together a really good kind of catalog email thing, and the simple sort of stuff just. Uh, there's probably more I could do to sort of simplify my workflow, but that'd be my advice to you is spend more time mm -hmm. on your process of how you're going to get out there and, and like thinking through the process to get the content from your head to your audience in the, in the, in the lead up so that 20 weeks from now, 30 weeks from now, the fatigue, you're not going to be getting fatigue, not because mm -hmm. you don't have anything to share, but because you're like, I don't want to spend 30 minutes having to go make sure the template's right and this right. and all that because that's where I drop off. My fade happens with everything else that comes after. Yeah. You know, that was, um, I mean, that was part of the reason why I didn't start this off as a podcast. I mean, I have a lot of, uh, you know, experience making podcasts, but there's so I've much heard. overhead. <laughs> there's so much overhead involved in just owning a podcast between mm -hmm. hosting websites, RSS feeds, directories uh, uh editing music like there's so much around it and the podcast format is very open the audio format is very open to a lot of different things but if what i'm trying to do is is create a low friction project um then then keep a text keep it a thing where if i spend five minutes on it in a day or two hours on it i am getting um a lot of work done and i can do it in a lot more places yeah yeah, yeah, no. So I think I think start simple, start there. You know, I I sit down like I'm in the process of working on a, uh, you know, yet another idea for an app. As I I you know have bring in some friends to help me with another one. I'm like ah, I like to make things, mm -hmm. and I'm going to like dribble, you know, dribble.com, and I've been looking at like 
what what do I want? How, as a consumer or a user, what do I want? I have the idea behind my head, the problem I'm trying to solve, but also how do I want, what do I like? So with your email, like I would make notes of like what you think is done really well. And sometimes the things that like the things that work best are invisible because they just work. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, take a look at that. Yeah. You know, and, trying to be very, um, user orient or user first is 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 something i try to keep in mind with with a lot of yeah. the with all the stuff that we do because there's it's so easy to get lost on this side of it where you're just like i need to organize these things because i have this concept but people don't go into emails thinking about your concept they go into emails reading the very first word you know uh there's so you have to take their perspective into account so let me if i can I extend this just sorry i want to i want to pitch you an idea i want to hear your take on this okay, okay? I periodically get people who say like, oh, you did a live stream. I'm upset. I wish I knew. You know, I got maybe four people tell me this, but still people tell me this. Mm -hmm. I wish I knew you did this thing. And maybe sending an, e sending an email out is maybe helpful, but a lot of people check their email periodically, but sometimes people want to know. Mm -hmm. Notifications are interesting. And so I just built an application that works on iOS and Android that does notifications. And so I went to, so like background notifications. So in the middle of whatever, it'll pop up on your phone when the app's not running or whatever. And I went through the whole, hmm. that fun thing aside. Now I know it. Right. Now I understand it. Now, now I know how it works. Now I had to build it. Now I know how to build apps on all the platforms that have that. And I think I was thinking about an idea I had a while ago, which was a service where basically what it is, is, um, People would subscribe to like I'd say, hey, if you want notifications, whenever you want to know, if you want me to pop a pop up, just subscribe to this, and you'll get a pop up notification whenever I do a thing. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of a bullhorn to say like, oh, yeah. I'm going on you know weird things. Oh, new book, Andrew Main, I have a new book out, whatever. And and so that was my idea was sort of like something like that to say, hey, check this out. And uh, and so the idea is it would be like an easy to use service like that where someone so what could it would say is you would yeah you would you would say you bryce would let, let's call it like bullhorn or whatever like this you would tell everybody oh go get the bullhorn app right yeah and then subscribe to me on there and mm -hmm. then anytime i have something cool or new i'm doing you'll get a notification pop up mm -mm -mm. i um that's interesting because because there are so many services that do like Twitch, people can choose to subscribe and get and get notifications. Mm -hmm. Of course, on Twitter, you can uh, sign up to get notifications when uh, mm -hmm. somebody tweets anything. Um, but having a more curated push notification thing like that, and so you could what send them to specific deep links, or do would they have to go to the app that generated the? No, notification? it could be deep link. You could you could you could deep link. You could say tweet this link to everybody. Tell them I'm doing blank. And so because like mm -hmm. notifications, you can push that through. So because uh, it would be basically a a yeah I get into the technical thing, but yes, the thing would be like, and I could put like payload mm -hmm. of your image or whatever. So it would pop up, but it would be like bullhorn or whatever. I'm just throwing that name out there. There would be like Bryce da 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 here. Yeah, I th that's that would be really. In fact, I th there, uh, I'm I'm a little distracted because I thought that there was a service that did something like that, but I think Wait. not. But that would be I, I, that would be a really helpful thing because I'm I'm sure there are. So much of what people want to use, like vanity apps or their own apps, is to, you know, create a funnel to drive acquisitions and sales, and uh, have it so that people who are really interested in the person or the or the property uh, can get push notifications. And I think if you had something that was meant to uh, go for, um, say, you know, not as big big names, and have it be like, here's a thing where people use our app to get notifications. I think I think. There's, I think it's possible, but you have to make the sign up process very easy. Because if the thing is like, if you want to follow me on all of these different services, now you need to get another service and fi and find me on it and hit the button and make your own account there, like that that is the is the real th trick of it. Yeah, that that's the hard part is is that you're 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 telling people you got to download this app and sign up for this app to be able to to track me. That is the, the hard part. But, and, and I agree, that's the thing that's sort of like, well, it's another thing to say, but then the idea is like, oh, you can track everything on here through here, you know, plus if other people you want to know what they're doing. The advantage is, is that if once your fans are on it and they're listening to me and I'm like, oh yeah, guys, I'm on there too. They go, oh, cool. I'm going to get notified by Andrew Maid on there too. Yeah. Um, and, and 
I think the other thing is you can really target this at specific types of creators, right? If you're like YouTubers almost certainly do not need this. Um, not that they would not find any use of it, but that the, the, the background notification process is democratized on YouTube. You can follow someone mm -hmm. and not get notifications. You can follow someone and get some or follow them and get all of them that people already have the choice and all of the options there. But if you are say a, an, a, a writer, an author, uh, say that uh, maybe you're a podcaster, right? Like podcast apps can give you push notifications, but not everybody listens to all of the podcasts that they download. I certainly don't. I have a lot of podcasts that I download every week and do not listen to. Um, well, remember too, like the 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 YouTuber case could be YouTube works great when you're going through that YouTube platform, though. If I am a YouTuber and I'm like, oh, I'm going to go on Bryce's Twitter, I'm going to be on guesting on Bryce's YouTube channel, or I'm hopping on Twitch, or I just have a cool thing I want to tell you all about. Oh, sure. You, you're not going to make a whole video about that. That's a good point. Um, yeah. um, though, I guess I think for on, on YouTube, if I was YouTube, if I was personified YouTube.com, I would say, well, we have a whole communities channel, a whole community tab on your channel that um, people might be able to get push notifications for it too. But, but I, I think beyond that, I, I think there are just plenty of, of types of creators who don't have any means, any easy way to do this. Yeah. Um, that I think an app like that would be would be really great. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. All right. Uh, did okay. Did you have an after things pick, by the way? Did, is there uh, anything... My my after things pick is uh, if you read Console Wars by Blake J Harris and you like really cool video game stuff, my pick is you check out the brand hot new video game newsletter by Mr. Bryce Castillo. <laughs> 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 you go to was it Nesh, yeah, go to his website which is at neshcom.com click the thing that says games newsletter uh give me an email or just take a look at the show notes it'll be in the show notes uh along with all the other picks that we have every week here uh, on the wonderful things. weird things podcast yeah i mean so after things. please support bryce bryce is the best of us <laughs> so, <laughs> um really really looking forward to that i'm excited about because i love like uh, somebody had asked me, like, do you play video games? And I was, I went to a wedding. It was at Randy Pitchford's house, you know, Mr. Gearbox. Mm -hmm. And somebody's asked me about video games. Do you play video games? I'm like, no, but like, I read a surprisingly large amount about this, and I will go deep dive into why people like it or whatever. And, you know, I've, I not that I don't dislike, not that I dislike him. I just have this thing about, oh, I'm spending too much, too much time. But I'm, I'm looking forward to this, Bryce. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to do it. I, I don't think I've had a text project. I don't think I've ever done a text thing. I've always done audio or video. So I'm excited to, um, but I love, I love typing and writing and stuff. So uh, I'm excited to have a form of that. That is, um, uh, is, is in this way. I, I'm excited for it. Cool. It's been after. Hey, thank you so much for, for all the, all the, all the advice. That's, uh, uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. You're smart enough to know, to, to decide, you know, figure out your own path between what Brian and I are saying and understanding that we're so, so like, uh, our, our vision is based upon our experiences and stuff, you know, and, and so clearly, um, you know, you know, make the thing, my, yeah. my, my strongest advice was what I said before is like, make your workflow as easy as possible, mm -hmm. make the workflow as easy as possible as man, like. You know, often we something what kills our energy isn't the thing. It's just the, how many steps I have to drive through to make it happen. Yeah, I mean, when I was doing that music playlist slash newsletter, like it would be every time I have to make the playlist and then I have to duplicate it to the best of my ability on on iTunes or in Apple Music, but I didn't have an Apple Music subscription anymore. And so mm -hmm. then you're you're maintaining two different playlists and then re like like all these other things um, that were. Um, and then typing it up, right? And then just typing yep. it up, um, all, all of these different things. So I'm excited to like, uh, yeah, take it from the beginning of like, this is about the bandwidth that I can give to this. And with a mind of like, let's keep this as easy as we can, as we can make it, right? I'm looking at, I'm looking into now, like, and may, I don't know if you know of any, but um, an, an app to make graphics for uh, for this. If I, if I need little headers or little somethings, um, cause I've seen some things, but I don't know what is like, what have you looked at before I make a suggestion of, um, I think the big one that I spent some time with, and I would like to spend even more time with it is Adobe spark post. 
mm -hmm. which uh, I believe ties into Adobe. I think it's it's Spark or Max, which is like their creative cloud um, social media thing. Like their their whole thing is like here. Here's a way to if you're a business, here's an easy way to make Instagram posts with texts on it. Um, and so I've been looking into that as a wings of like if I have a screenshot, how easy would it be for me to put either a bit of text on here or a transparent graphic on top of it um, and I still haven't kind of figured it out because it's not meant it's not meant for making graphics like that it's meant for making social media posts yeah there's a there's an app that I got years ago and I haven't used it lately let me make sure that it's still there um, oh, yeah. I think I, it was a it was a pick at one time um, that's, that's the worst when you download something or when you offload an app from your phone and it's been delisted and it will not download again that is yeah so it was frustrating yeah, I can't find it anymore, which was which was Poster, P-H-O-S-T-E-R, which is pretty cool. And the problem is, like, there's a lot of stuff that's kind of cool, but then they, they have, like, this really ridiculous sort of per-monthly rate. Mm -hmm. um, another one is uh, Canva. You know what? I did download Canva, and I have not had a chance to use it yet. Yeah, and it's also, like, web-based, too. So Canva's pretty good. And Canva, you know, their model is, like, if you want to buy extra, like, uh, themes. Uh, yeah, like, you know, things like that. So, like, Canva I've used. Canva is cool because actually in some stuff I've had where, like, I tell people, like, if you want to make podcast cover art or whatever, I just link right to Canva for that. Okay. So, Canva's cool. Um, uh, yeah, I'll check that out because I think the thing that stopped me was I was spending I, – I had just spent a little bit of time with Spark Post, and, I th and because I have Creative Cloud, I get access to their premium stuff already. I'm already paying for their premium stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and with Canva, it wanted me to sign up, and I thought, eh and they don't have the sign up with apple yet so uh, i it, it made me that it mm -hmm. was just it's just a little thing that made me bounce off of it but i i still have it downloaded so i'll check this out because um because it looked like good because there are a lot of like crappy looking ones of these out on the app store yeah so what's your goal what do you want to do um uh, something where if i needed to um if i had to make say graphics or little headers or whatever for the email list on my phone could I do it on, could I do that all on my phone or would I need to open up Photoshop? If, if there's a way I can not have to open up Photoshop on my desktop computer, um, that would be just to do simple, a simple, either like a simple watermark or simple cropping or, you know, basic um, photo editing stuff. Is there an app that would let me templatize that in a way? Um, uh, Velvet Lip. No, sorry. C Spawn in the chat says that Canva is highly intuitive. So another uh, thumbs up for Canva. Yeah, like Canva. Like I was trying to, because like Canva's got really good. Like, he, like I think I've used them before to create like Twitter headers and stuff like that. And, okay. Um. So I just trying to log in there. Like, oh, we've changed our security thing, which tells me something bad happened there, but they're not telling anybody. <laughs> um, huh. And see, see, these are these are. And salute like these are posters, business cards, flyers. Like, um, what I'm looking for is like assets. I need a graphics app to help make assets. Just have in there. They have uh, um, a like ways to get like you. What do you? So you want to say you want assets? You want to do what? Like if I if I wanted a little uh, if I if I had. If I had a fun idea for like a top 10, a top 10 dogs in video games. And I just wanted to, like, I already had a template put together. I already had a little background. Um, or maybe even I, maybe I even already went in, in Photoshop at one point and made the background. I just want a thing so that I can put text on it. Um, and it looks the same as all the other times I've put text on a header for like review. Well, Canva's good. Oh, Canva, like, will Spark, the Vantage Spark post lets you create a template. Okay. Spark. Spark post, you can create a template and you can just up grab your image and you can throw it under spark post lets you save templates. So mm. spark might be, you know, I've used it for that. Cause like they have like a podcast album art template. Oh, okay. Huh. Uh, um, and you might maybe stay there. I'm looking at spark post right now to see. Um, yeah. I mean, that's the nice thing about that is the, the, the idea of the templates and creating your own. Mm -hmm. but, well, and and um, just, just the fact that um, the, the, the fact that like, it already is part of the Adobe Creative Cloud stuff that I subscribe to, so that there is not a, a nagging thing asking me for even more money. Um, uh, JC Calhoun recommends easily, easel.ly.
Uh, Velvet says, does Spark require you to have that subscription? I don't believe so. I Because I think... Um, I think the Adobe Spark stuff is free, but if you want the premium templates or, you know, if you are doing any Adobe stuff, then you would need the subscription for the Adobe stuff. Okay, easily. I'll check that out too. Thank you, JC Cohen. Uh, oh, goodness, yeah. it's 4.30. Okay, I, I do gotta right. go. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you, Andrew Main, for sticking around. Hosting, Man, as always. Excited. Yeah. Yep. Uh, everybody, we'll be back with Corey in a little bit. Check out Andrew Main on his website and his uh, his tweets. All right, bye, everybody. Yay, me. We can say a lot in a little bit. Pressure in our minds made us.